We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andrew and I'm here with Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. And uh, my nephew's birthday is coming up, so got him one of those TCL 6 series TVs, an R635, 55 inch, which is actually mm. a bit large for his room, but not going to go smaller because smaller doesn't exist. And uh, yeah, <laughs> ch- chipped in with uh, my parents and his parents. So, you know, uh, with the year that has gone by, definitely feel like it's the a kids. business write off, Rob. Yeah. It's a business write off. <laughs> not quite. You can, you, can, you can answer questions about <laughs> it if they'll ever let you in well, the house. Well, that, that is definitely part of it. Uh, there There is some fun to be had. I opened it up to uh, check it out because I had actually gotten like an open box deal on a television before and only to discover it had like a white stuck pixels, a, a little blob of them uh, there. That, so that yeah. one I had to go back. So I'm like, okay. th- this one was purchased brand new, but you never know. A brand new TV could still have a flaw. So I opened it up to check it out. And uh, yeah, if you look at like the the artings, the ratings review, uh, and you go through their settings, they're like, oh, make sure that, you know, we've posted our white balance settings because you can uh, only via the Roku app uh, on those six series TVs, you have to use the app. You can adjust the white balance and the color points. It's like advanced settings that you can't do in the TV itself. But they're like, you know, this could vary panel to panel. So don't just plug in our values and assume that they're correct. So if you look at their values, they had a whole bunch of like minus blue and plus uh, red. Yeah, because it was like clearly the unit that they had had too much blue in it, especially at the high end. Well, I was just, you know, browsing around some of the... Uh, content i'm like man this this looks too red <laughs> with the out of the box setting i'm like this looks too red but i'm not totally sure so uh hooked up uh, my my colorimeter and and ran calman and i haven't run calman since the most recent update which i think was november was the most recent update and like okay. holy cow is that easy to use now like they redid oh. they redid the workflows a little bit and I'm like, man, they they just hold your hand through it now. It's like it's so so How easy. How much does that cost? Through. How much does Calman uh, cost? It's like 150 bucks for the home version now. Huh? So and that comes with a color. No, it color does not come with a meter. Now. That is just the software. Now I just have the uh, i1 display, uh, so nothing super fancy. But uh, yeah, plugged it in, and sure enough, I had to do a whole bunch of minus red and uh, a fair amount of plus blue. So mine was the reverse of uh, Arting's unit. It definitely shows the panel-to-panel variation. One can have too much blue, another one can have too much red, so you don't want to just uh, plug in someone else's values. But uh, yeah, mainly just wanted to mention, kind of amazing how easy Calman is to use now if you're getting the home version. And uh, yeah, pretty darn impressed with that TV, so hopefully enjoyed by my nephew on his birthday coming up cool cool uh it's florida and it's uh march (laughs) yes so um regardless of what it looks like outside your window the trees here have decided that it is summer okay and uh we are now full spring ahead (laughs) It's uh, it's pollen everywhere. My whole house, except for my wife, who doesn't really have allergies. Mm. The rest of us are all sneezing and coughing and sounding very much like we're spreading the Rona everywhere. Yeah. So it, I was really hoping to get a vaccine before this, <laughs> so I could, I could, I could just, I get to hold up my vaccine. I'm like looking at it tattooed on my forehead right. or something. I'm just gonna be like, just have wear this thing that says I got the vaccine. You mean to tell me uh, that, I'm, I'm, that these are allergies, I swear to God. <laughs> Punxsutawney Phil's prediction doesn't apply universally around the entire globe? No. Weird, huh? <laughs> yeah, so it... My tree out front has thought it was spring for like right. a month now, so that I, it's my car is, which parks underneath it has been green mm. with pollen, which has been a joy. But, uh, so it, I have a stack of tissue here. So if I you hear me starting to sneeze, I have been sneezing all day, and that's just sort of the thing. <laughs> uh, I will give the, my AV Rent listeners a little bit of a preview. I have written an article yesterday that's extremely long. Mm. It will not hit the website for at least a mm. week, probably. Uh, but it does compare audio files to cultists. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> that's uh, that's going to go over well. I'm sure. If I don't take it out, there is a picture in there of that I found so we use a website that has free pictures you sign up for it and whatever you can use the pictures you don't have to attribute it to anybody everybody who who uh, uploads pictures to it says that it's fine to 
to use their pictures in any way you want in the capacity. There's a picture of there of like a lady and a child in a room that I j- it just I don't even know if I should even conclude it in the article because okay. it's just sort of disturbing oh, I okay. and I and and then associating that with an article about cults yeah. it's. Uh, uh, if you're questioning the, the, it, probably the, the, better not. Just, just take it out. Yeah, I, I might take picture. it out. I might take it out. <laughs> I will at least take. I'll at least run it by Clint mm-hmm. before uh, I go live with it. But it's uh, it's a very long article. I okay. I, my wife's gotten sick of me saying this article has completely gotten away from me. Mm. <laughs> like I start, I thought start writing. I think it's going to be like five paragraphs, <laughs> and that one's over three thousand words. Mm. So <laughs> that was just. Well, I did yesterday. All right. This is uh, AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. Get your questions answered. All I have to do is ask yes by emailing us at question at avrant.com. Question at avrant.com. That's where your questions go. Yep. Nowhere else. You can also, if you'd like, go to avrant.com. There's comments that you can leave there. Facebook.com slash avrant co- uh, podcast, where we are pretty active and responsive. Uh, YouTube.com slash avrant, where the comments are turned off because YouTube is... Uh, like uh, the cantina the yep. beginning of Star I just Star, don't want to deal Star with it. Wars. That's really yeah. the reason. <laughs> yeah, and I, I and Clint's like, well, you know, if you do this and this and this, you can uh, it will fix all. I'm like, I'm not doing that. Nah. <laughs> all you gotta do is start blocking. No, I'm not doing that either. <laughs> I, I and I'll be honest with you. I, I, whenever I hit a comment section, I see the people. I earned four thousand dollars last month, but oh. working from home. I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, every, everybody did, dude. Everybody was working from home. You didn't invent that. It, the COVID did, and shut up. Or you know, you know, check out my race, my my Nazi website. Like, ah. oh, come on. just stop, just stop. Uh, let me see. You, YouTube.com. Yes, uh, you can contact Rob directly. Rob at avrent.com. His Twitter is at First Reflect. I'm Tom at avrent.com. My Twitter is at avrent underscore Tom. If you go to YouTube and just press play long enough on one of our videos, you will see our contact information underneath our names. Well, our Twitters so, anyway. There's Twitters. Right. Our, our emails aren't there? Nope. Oh, well. Whatever. I mean, you can't remember. I don't want to make it all easy. cluttered in our lower thirds. So That's fine. All right. We want to thank our listeners of the week. Have become a listener of the week. You have to support the podcast in some way. We have 120 patrons this week who... Uh, Signed up at patreon.com slash AV Rant Podcast. That's correct. Always forget it. I forget. AV Rant Podcast to become a contributing listener, contributing supporter of our uh, podcast, an ongoing subscriber. Every month, uh, patreon.com takes some money from them and gives it to us. So we have 120 patrons, including Alongo, who has uh, let us know that he is a patron. Yes, Probably has been a for a quite a patron. while. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think it was new. <laughs> nope. Patreon.com uh, slash Aviant Podcast for anyone who would like to sign up. Uh, yeah, 120 patrons, which is a drop. And I'm like, oh, is that is that because we mentioned Audio Science Review? No, it has nothing to do with that. It's it's because it's the first of the month. And anybody whose like, payment information uh, wasn't actually up oh, to date, right. I think, got purged from the list. So that's, that's where That'll about happen. five of our supporters went, I'm pretty darn sure, because we just rolled over into the new month. Uh, but for anybody who might like to make a one-time donation instead of an automatic monthly donation we do have paypal so uh, just come to our website avrant.com and on the right hand side there's a link that can take you to paypal if you want to do things that way all right uh let's uh, if you can't support us financially then just let us know what you did to support us and we'll mention you here infinite gary used our advice to get a u mic one from cross spectrum acoustics is it no longer Cross Spectrum Labs? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's Cross Spectrum Acoustics. Although, if you go to their website at the top, it still says Labs. So I guess he hasn't updated the text on okay. his website. But he's like, no, it's Cross Spectrum Acoustics. That's it, the. I'm gonna t- or Herb. I'm gonna tell you right now, dude. It's gonna it's gonna take me a while That's to get right. that one right. All right, I just gonna have to. I've been saying Cross Spectrum Labs for like a decade, <laughs> and so, you will you still know. see it on the website as of this recording. So you know. Yeah. So my friend, I have a friend, you know, I've got both, you know, we all have friends like that where you grew up and you called them Tommy right. or Jimmy or whatever, or Timmy. And, you know, they're, they're now, a, you know, gray haired adults mm-hmm. and you're like, hey, you know, hey, Timmy, pass me the salt. And everybody was like, who the heck is Timmy? And oh, yeah. Oh, I'm, Timothy, I'm still Robbie Timothy. to all my aunts and uncles because, you know, <laughs> my I'll always be younger than them. My wife calls me Tommy. My <laughs> parents call me Tommy. My brothers and sisters, sister called me Tommy. So, yeah, it's fine. If you called me Tommy, I'd be mm. like, hey, what's up, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, so uh, if the Gary used our advice to get a U mic one from Cross Spectrum Acoustics and XLR to RCA converters from Emotiva, all for his new Mono Price Monolith HTP One Pre Pro, he dropped our name to all of them. I will tell you that if I ever get a, a receiver or processor or whatever that can do six overheads, mm -hmm. I'm gonna do um, top fronts, top middles, top rears instead of surround backs. Okay. Because they're because they're kind of they're high enough, I think. I, whatever, it's fine. All right, that's fun to do. <laughs> uh, Scott asked Rob for some some time sensitive advice and gave a generous tip via PayPal as thanks. I did he give it to you? Because yep, he, straight to me. Okay. I was the one who responded. All right, all right that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. I was like, it didn't go to the AV one. It did one. not go to the AV Rant PayPal. It went straight that's to fine. my PayPal. <laughs> <laughs> that is fine. Alongo also asked for a time sensitive answer and sent both Tom and Rob Amazon gift cards as a thank you. Did he? It should be in your Tom at AV Rant. He was like, Rob, make sure Tom checks his Tom at AV Rant. So while Tom is doing that, since he wants to see if that's true, uh, if any, Gary, thanks for talking us up to Cross Spectrum Acoustics, Emotiva, and Monoprice. Scott, thank you very much for the generous PayPal uh, tip that was given a, as a thanks there. for uh, for for. It's going to be in spam or something. I don't someplace. know. Ilongo, thank you for the Amazon gift card. I know I got mine. <laughs> Let me see here. I uh, don't see it in spam. <laughs> All right, I'll, fi I'll find it. Uh, Chris sent some photos to me for my with permission to use them on AV gadgets, which I have not uh, I have not downloaded them yet, but I'm going okay. to because there's a couple in there that I'm interested in using. And we got some notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going from Trey, Scott, Alongo, Evans, and Bertrand. So yes. thank you. It's Trey, Scott, Alongo, Evans, Bertrand, and Chris. Indeed, I'll repeat the names. Chris, thanks for uh, giving Tom permission to use those photos of yours in perpetuity at avgadgets.com. People should check out that website. Tom's the editor-in-chief over there, avgadgets.com. Good stuff written up over there. And then Trey, Scott, Ilongo, Evans, and Bertrand, thank you all very much for the notes of gratitude and uh, encouragement for keeping the podcast going. It is appreciated. And yeah, it's going to bug Tom all podcast. I, I should have checked on no, that. No, it's before. not. I'm going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. I'm going to be fine. I'm just going to scroll. Do you know what day it came out? I think it was Tuesday. It was quite a bit earlier in the week. Oh, okay. Hold it was on. like a week ago. I'm looking now in trash. I don't know why it would be in trash, but there's Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday. Okay. I don't know for sure yeah. that it was Tuesday. It might, have, it might have been earlier or later. All right. You know what? While Tom is doing that, let's go into the news because, uh, yeah, some pretty obvious news for anyone who's uh, following the people that we follow. SVS launched their new 1000 Pro Series subwoofers. Who could have possibly predicted that uh, there would be a 1000 We totally Pro predicted it. Well, I, mean <laughs> I almost totally out of them on their stupid website because they posted something to... Um, uh, they posted something to Facebook and, yes. uh, you know, that, that there are big news coming up. And I almost went underneath and said, <laughs> uh, is it the 1000 Pros <laughs> being released? Because I'm pretty sure that's what it is. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I won't be that guy. That's right. So I, I didn't do it. But I'll be honest with you. It was I, I, it, it was an act of I found it, by the way. Oh, good. It isn't. It was an act of 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 will to stop right. me from typing that. i had it half typed out and i was like <gasps> i'm i know i'm right mm -hmm. <laughs> and i don't i mean a little bit of deductive reasoning you know we we got a little a, bit we got a i mean this was not sherlock series. holmes level this was <laughs> this was not this is this is this not you know nine thousand IQ. Right. this was nine after the 16 IQ. ultra series and then its features largely came to the 4000 series and then there was a 3000 series and then a 2000 pro series and they, you know the features kept trickling down and they're like well you know that 1000 series is still there hasn't been updated in a while could there possibly be a 1000 pro series in the works and of course there was and is it is yeah. it is here now yeah. <laughs> well, what do you think they're going to do next i think they're going to go 1500 1500 2500 3500 4500 that's what i think it could be I mean, That's they have right. to rename the 16 Ultra series because that that sticks out now. So, it does. Uh, so, did you? How far did you? Uh, I just you get said on that this? it's here, so you can start with uh, the right. sealed SB1000 Pro. All right, the sealed SB1000 Pro will start. Uh, still starts at five hundred dollars for ash black or black ash, whatever. Ash black. Ash black. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Black ash vinyl wrap five hundred. Black ash vinyl finish the vinyl finish. It's six hundred dollars to get you the piano black or the gloss white. And the new PB one thousand Pro 
The PB is only available in Black Ash for $600, no more ported $500 model in the SVS lineup. Mm -hmm. So it's $600 more. And when you look at that, you're like, really? Why? Well, it's literally materials. <laughs> And well, it's, it's just... a larger driver than the old PB-1000. Yeah. The PB-1000 was the only 10-inch model in the entire lineup because the SB-1000 had a 12-inch driver. Now, both the SB-1000 Pro and PB-1000 Pro use the same 12-inch driver. But the different there's always been a isn't there always been a difference in price between the sealed box and the ported box because of the nope. extra parts? Nope, nope. they were five hundred dollars uh, each a, in the basic finish. Oh, in the one thousand. That's why I'm thinking of a two thousand model. Okay, okay. So both use the same new stamped basket 12 inch driver, which we talked about the last time we talked to them. Uh, that stamped is not necessarily a bad thing. Made it to a new 325 watt sledge amp as the pro name implies the svs amp is now included for control app is included for control which also brings three bands of parametric eq to the svs entry level models for the first time the same physical control buttons as the 3000 series and 2000 pro series are on the back but the 1000 pro series also has a high level speaker wire inputs which is unique to the series in svs's lineup mm -hmm. the upgrades mean that the SB1000 Pro now hits 20 hertz at minus 3 dB. And from the frequency response graphs posted on SVS's website, they appear to be using the Sledge's Amps DSP to keep the response linear down to a lower frequency than you might expect from a sealed design. The PP1000 Pro claims a 17 hertz minus 3 dB extension in the ported mode, which now utilizes two ports. So I don't have to look at a single port that is off to one side anymore, right. which was driving me nuts as long as especially with the driver being on the other side it was just irritating me <laughs> my phone's ringing in the other room i can hear ah. it it's driving me nuts i can also be put in sealed mo mode where it claims extension down to 19 hertz and has a more gradual roll off that starts at a higher frequency and as is more typical of a sealed design so both new models are available right now and we should be talking with svs very soon on this that podcast. is so, absolutely okay. the plan we are supposed to be talking with gary yakubian once again we will you know, not say for sure until it's actually done because change can always uh, occur. Uh, plans can always fall through. Right. But uh, at some point, I am sure we will talk to him uh, about yeah. these because we all want to. Yes, we do. So it'll be exciting yeah. to talk about that and talk about the fact that the next ones are going to be for 1500 models. Cause <laughs> I mean, it might be a 5500 series that replaces the 16 Ultras, you know? You got, like I said, yeah. that name's got to change. <laughs> yeah. So this comes from Carl, uh, an Austrian luxury brand, C-Seed, C, letter C, Seed, like a thing you put in the ground, realized that the last thing any potential Samsung the wall consumer might want would be for their 165 inch micro LED TV to remain visible when not in use. So they've come up with a version that folds the screen in made possible by the modular design of micro LED displays and then hides the entire rectangular column in the floor. They call it the, C oh my God, the C Seed M1 165 inch foldable micro LED TV. And it will only set you back $400,000. So if you are thinking the same thing I'm thinking, which is the last thing I want from my massive, massive LED, super expensive display, is that it have movable parts that could somehow <laughs> break, then you don't have $400,000 burning a hole in your pocket I mean, like I don't. So, I, I, yeah. I am not even joking when I say the people who are going to buy this, they're going to buy it. It's going to get like, maybe it'll get demoed to them, although they're probably going to be away somewhere while it's being installed for them. It's going right. to be folded up. It's going to lower itself down into their floor. And then they are like literally never going to use it. <laughs> I there's gonna be like I, mean, I have the, it. The, the demo home they put this thing in. Right. I mean, if you realize how big this thing is, the demo home they put this in, the just the space that they have on camera yes. would fit most of our houses. <laughs> like just, that's right. just that's right. slap it down there, and the entire house is in this big open room that has wall to ceiling windows everywhere and hard surfaces and one. Wait, I'm sorry, one chair, one couch, and no speakers. So you know, mm -hmm. this is a very practical design. But yeah, it looks, it does look extremely awesome, I'm <laughs> sure. It better for $400,000. I mean, I'm like telling the kids, don't even walk over there. That's right. <laughs> don't, don't let the dog go over there. Nothing. All right. So forget CBS All Access. Mm -hmm. It's gone. Erased from memory. Space is cleared up. What takes its place? I 
I, I, I don't want to say. I don't, but you must. I don't want to have to say this. You must. I don't, I, I, Paramount Plus is here now. Yes. Well, thank you, Disney, for ruining it for all of us. <laughs> So Paramount Plus is here now. Since CBS has now reemerged with Viacom, this rebranding expands the content library and also comes with the announcement that Paramount theatrical releases will show up on Paramount Plus only 30 to 45 days after theaters. $5 a month gets you access, but with ads. Uh, $10 a month removes the ads and also lets you stream 4K with Dolby Vision on some titles. No mention of Dolby Atmos Audio, although that doesn't necessarily mean it isn't available we just don't know about yeah they it just yet, so. they just didn't care this enough is, to put it in the press release right this is more akin to the prices of hulu than it is the prices mm. of say netflix so um as we all know rob dropped netflix i did i talking about it for a while yep. and uh that happened on the I'm first i'm unwilling to do so but I, i'm realizing that if i drop netflix i could get like two to three other services right. that i might be more interested in I just don't want to live with CBS all or with our Paramount Plus for a super long time because I don't think I I just want to watch like the Star Trek stuff. Yeah, well, you can maybe. do month to month, and I mean, you yeah. mentioned Hulu, and uh, again, Hulu is only available in the United States. Disney Plus added Star everywhere else, uh, which is basically the Hulu content, uh, but right. just rolled into Disney Plus whether you wanted it or not. But they only bumped up the price, I think, two dollars. Per month. Yeah, you wanted it for two bucks. Let me tell you that. Much. Absolutely. I mean, that came in just as I was canceling Netflix. I'm like, yeah, I really don't miss Netflix. <laughs> I right. Really don't. So there's a couple of things on Netflix that I'm, I'm currently right. watching. Uh, uh, my my son's really interested in Cobra Kai, so we're finishing up the third season yeah. of Cobra Kai. You know, my wife likes that show whose name I can't say because even though it's spelled S C. H I T T. Oh, I'm not sure. going to say it. That's Canadian show. We've had it for ages. <laughs> the the Creek, yes. the Creek show. Oh, you can say it's with Creek. The... That's fine. It's not swearing. It's S C H I I T. You say it. You say it. That's, that's but, what uh, it is. It's a real place here. I understand that, <laughs> but uh, my wife just she. I don't know. She got. She started watching the show. I'm like, I don't really like it. Is what I said. And then she said, but you laugh throughout the entire thing. Mm. I'm like, I laugh at everything. Okay. I laugh at everything. <laughs> And now I'm starting to like it. And then she's like, I don't know if I like this anymore. I'm like, well, too bad. We've got eight seasons to get through. That's right. I? <laughs> so. All right, I got some comments from listeners here. Alan wanted to say he actually thought Rob's comment about audio science review was fair or were fair. Uh, but since we more or less limited the discussion to only the speaker reviews, it didn't paint the full picture of the broader range of topics that are covered on the ASR forum. Alan thinks the objective measurements that have been posted for wires and cables help to settle any of the ridiculous audio file debate, and the measurements of amplifiers and DACs are pretty cut and dry. So all in all, Alan agrees, it's a useful place to go for measurement data. And for any members of our audience who might not be familiar, there's a lot more to look at than just speaker reviews. Uh, yeah, so this whole cable thing that <laughs> seems to won't go away, it, it's like, it, 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 it's almost like, to me, I, I, it's just, it's been so long settled that I, I don't think that it, like having more settlement of it makes it any more settled. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. the only people who believe it believe that magic is real. Yeah, you know, they believe that there's fairies and Harry Potter's uh, documentary and all of that because they must because that's the <laughs> only thing that makes any sense for why they believe that cables make a difference. Uh, anything other than a negative difference, uh, but it, it just. I so, liked, but yeah, uh, I guess that's good. I liked uh, Gene's most recent uh, video on the Audioholics YouTube channel where he's like, uh, he, was, he was testing the whole thing of can you, if you have excess wire, you know, extra length, um, if you coil it, if you, you know, wrap it around in a circle. <laughs> right, right. Because, I mean, it, it's true if you wrap a wire around enough times, it becomes an inductor. You know, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's how you make one. So it doesn't have that effect. He's like, yeah, you can actually measure it. And if you can hear 50,000 hertz, <laughs> then there's a possibility that that measurement might impact. But uh, if you wrap it around a big piece of metal, you might make yourself an electromagnet. Right. So, you know. But chances are knows. you can't hear 50,000 hertz. So, uh, so no. Chances are you're not a bat. Coiling, coiling <laughs> up your speaker wire a little bit is just fine. <laughs> All right, let's get to some questions let's here. Shout. Dale. Dale Dale is back after our 2.1 and 5.2.4 gear recommendations. Okay. So did you buy them? Because if not, then what are you here well, for, sir? To clarify, it's his uncle that has just moved into a new house and wants these two systems, and he came to Dale for help, so Dale came to us. That's right. Ah. 
taking credit for our work again, are you, Dale? Absolutely. So you wouldn't be the first, nor will you be the last. <laughs> who was it? I don't remember who it was that years ago contacted us and says, everybody thinks I'm the AV guy because they <laughs> ask me questions. I ask you questions and I give them answers and they think that I know all this stuff. I'm like... Who's who's to say that we're not doing the same thing? It seems unlikely with the amount of podcasts we've done every week. <laughs> really? <laughs> the amount of time, so that's so much, it's so clear. I'm just ba- basing everything on my own experience and memory. <laughs> yeah, it's, you might be, but I'm not. <laughs> so we didn't have any info about the 2.1 room. So it's an open area, 13, I mean, sorry, 11 feet by 13 and, and three quarters with a fireplace for the listening area itself. Uh, so the listening, the fireplace is flanked by two windows and it's in the center of the room. And on the right side, there's like a little alcove a little bit on the left yeah. side there. There's a stair. Yeah. So stairs and it's, uh, it's open to the dining room of similar dimensions, which got to be behind it. Plus the stairs and another small room and, and it's open and irregularly shaped with that. Right. So now that we know that, first of all, how would we orient to the 2.1 setup in this space? I'd stick it in that alcove. <laughs> Oh, okay. That little alcove. I go. I I stick it to the right. So um, you would have the fireplace as the left wall. Yes. And the dining I room would. open to your right, and the stairs to your yeah. back. So I, I would put a. I would put some seating, sort of, so that just just behind the fireplace, so okay. it looks like you're kind of framing in the fireplace, and another set of seating, which would be on the right wall, the right area wall, or whatever, to kind of frame in the area. Okay. And then uh, you could put like a bookshelf or some uh, uh, what you call it, uh, you know, panels or whatever on the wall that it has the stairs on it. Uh, you could put an acoustic panel above the fireplace mm-hmm. that in, you know, like a printed one that had art on it back there. And then if how I don't know how attached you are to that alcove, but you could literally just put like a false wall and fill the whole thing up <laughs> with. The, Good, you know what I mean? Just just fill it up with insulation top to bottom cover it with some fabric that matches the uh or put the you know uh, that matches the, the 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 paint color which is like off white or bone or something like that. So tell. what's your reasoning for going that orientation? Just, just to answer my answer would be I would just put speakers to the left and right of the fireplace and I would face the fireplace and the windows because I'm thinking I could put panel or two on the stair part i could put a panel or two in that alcove and i have a little bit closer to sideways symmetry uh and behind me the dining room is just open so i'm not too worried about a a back wall reflection that that right so yeah so rob's way of doing it it would be just fine and there's nothing wrong with that uh what that does is it what i'm trying to do is frame in the the area so that it still looks like it's a functional place for people to sit around okay. and talk without putting speakers in front of the windows, okay. which would just, you know, to me, it, to me, it takes that room and makes it into something that is clearly a listening room instead of a room that has a listening area in okay. it, uh, or a space that has a listening area. I think either one works. My, the problem with mine more than anything is that, uh, you can't really put a panel to the left of the left yeah, front speaker. Yeah, to like even out the openness that would end up being on the right hand side, which is which would it, open. If you wanted to do that, you could by putting a freestanding panel mm. there, but then you're covering that window and maybe part of the w- fireplace. Once, <laughs> maybe part of the yeah. fireplace. So, yeah, that that is an issue. But I thought we talked about electrostatics in here or something. Martin Logan no, or something. Well, Did we not do that? I mean, Martin Logan kind of came up with probably the motion series with the folded ribbon tweeter. But yeah. so I mean, I guess it's a matter of visually what do you want to be more like the centerpiece like if you're okay with speakers being visual and kind of drawing your eye as you walk into this room right then mine makes sense they're on either side of the fireplace um and then if you want it more of okay the room looks at it and it just happens to have a pair of speakers in it then tom's orientation makes right. more sense there. well and then you can also take and if you wanted to have a gear rack in the center of them you right. know like one of those nice ones and put all the gear in the center you could do that as well sure. uh it, i guess it kind of depends too we don't know exactly where he's he is and like in florida People put crap inside the, in, in front of their fireplaces all the time because right. we don't ever use yeah. them. You know, yeah, there's like the two fireplace days is a year. never on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So why, you know, if that's the case, then you can just put the equipment rack right in front of the fireplace, but the speakers on either side, and then you know, do it Rob's way. So I guess you have options here. Yeah, but really um, only two, and I think it makes sense based on how this room is going to be used. Yeah. 
So one sub or two PC2000 Pro cylinder or SB2000 Pro. It's not SB. Uh, you got too much space to fill up for the SB2000. Agreed. Um, Pro. But, uh, and I don't know how many chairs you care about. I thought yeah. it was just one. Pretty much, because this is if the it... two-channel system. So it's, it's yeah. really one seat that is primarily cared about, as far as we're aware. And if that's the case, and you're not really worried about too many seats that are too far apart, then one subwoofer yeah. will be just fine. Uh, you know, you should still should do the subwoofer crawl mm -hmm. and try to kind of figure it out. You know, you're gonna our very last here. question is someone who has a has a uh, is irked by the subwoofer crawl, but I don't think we're even going to get to it in this week's uh, thing. So we'll address that next week. I just know it's coming up and that he's presently cringing. <laughs> Stay irked, sir. Yep. Irk, irk away. It's, Believe me, it's gonna, my whole life is being it's irked. It's going to get addressed, but uh, yeah, I'm in total agreement. Uh, you don't want to go with the sealed sub in this room. We weren't sure if it was small and enclosed. Uh, now we know it is definitely not small and enclosed. It is wide open. So yeah, you want to go with the ported one. The cylinder is fantastic in that it takes up a small footprint. And yes, I think one will we be We don't sufficient. even know if that's going to be enough to fill up the space. But again, we don't you have insane. a space that's so open yeah. to the rest of the house. Uh, you really don't want to be completely pressurizing the space. And on top of that, you know, the S the SB, the footprint of the SB 2000 and the footprint of the PC 2000 aren't really all that yeah, different. It's pretty much you the just, same. That's right. You just, you just get the height. You just get the extra extension from height, which is why I love cylinder subs. So did I just go too far? No, I didn't. Is the larger open space a good reason to choose the outlaw monoblock amps that Rob mentioned? No, nope. <laughs> No, unnecessary. You're like, you're completely <laughs> unnecessary. You are not. If you sat on the back wall, <laughs> you know, right. of, of, if you sat against the stairs and then put the speakers in, like uh, on the wall in the alcove, we'd still go. Yeah, you don't need an amp. Sorry. No, I only <laughs> mention them because uh, we started with wanting tubes, and I'm like, if this is a person who originally wanted tubes but i'm convincing you not to get tubes maybe mono blocks is the consolation prize and they'll be happy with that and i don't mind recommending them because they're not outlandishly expensive if you get the outlaw ones but absolutely not a technical reason to get them no you definitely don't need them there's no reason to have i mean unless you buy a speaker that is extremely hard to drive which would again not going to be, be any unlikely. of the ones we recommended yeah and I mean, if you did, if your uncle or whoever went into like Best Buy or Magnolia or whatever, and they they saw one of those massive Mag, uh, uh, Martin Logan or electrostatic like that, yeah. that would yeah, well blow the speakers, budget. <laughs> it would it would completely blow the budget. Number one, number two, uh, you probably still wouldn't need an amplifier because mm. you're sitting so close to them. I mean, I don't think you're going to be farther than five feet from a speaker in this space maybe six at the yeah, most yeah you could be so. six or seven if you sit the with the room being 13 feet front to back the, with the you know with the fireplace on your left it's possible but yeah all right uh sorry rob suggested the sony x 1100 es as a universal displayer dale has its predecessor the x 1000 es and he really isn't using it so he could give it to his uncle any reason to buy the 1100 over the 1000 no <laughs> okay i mentioned the 1100 because that's the currently available model but the 1000 would be totally fine i had no idea that dale had it oh no that's 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 a great way for you to upgrade your own that's stuff, right which is what I like to do. Uh, so we made suggestions for Ascend, CAF, SVS, and RVH speakers. Can we boil it down to a single no a go-to choice? Put them in a box and pull a paper out. Whichever one you pull out, <laughs> that's the one you should buy. These are all fantastic options. You cannot go wrong. Cannot go wrong. I boiled it down since there's also the home theater that he's talking about. Right. Uh, and for a very an, another simple logistical reason, I'm like, I think for this two channel room, just get a pair of uh, SVS Ultra Bookshelf speakers. Yeah. Because one, you're go you're already going to be getting the SVS sub. In fact, you're going to be getting three of them because he's going to be getting two for the theater and one for this room. So you're already ordering from SVS. It's easy to order their speakers as well. We will totally vouch for the quality of the speakers and. If it happens to turn out somehow that he doesn't like them, he can return them for absolutely free with no cost in the shipping. So it's like, it's the zero risk choice and they're really good anyway. So, and you can easily order everything all from one company. So if you want us to boil it down in this instance, I say get some 
uh, SVS Ultra Bookshelf Speakers for the 2.1 setup. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Plus, I think in the two-channel system, as stupid and unnecessary as it is, people very much like to have things that are sort of... It, 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 there's more of an aesthetic thing that happens mm -hmm. where you're like, everything matches and it has, has pretty blue lights and stuff like that. So having... You know, especially in this more open room where there's going to be light involved, getting a, you know, the gloss black version yep. of the ultra spe uh, speakers, uh, I think is a nice way of kind of setting this up as being a little bit nicer. And plus, you might you might even spend a little bit more on the stands and get like sure. a kind of a, a, a high techy looking stand yeah. uh, or, or, you know, more whatever fits your aesthetic in this room. But I, I think that that's a good idea. Uh, again, I have would have no problems with you choosing any of the other speakers. Oh, yeah. If you're looking for something that looks really interesting, the Kefs mm -hmm. are a really great choice because of their their concentric driver design. You know, just throw the if they have a uh, uh, a grill, just throw the grill away <laughs> because you're Actually, never, they, you, you should, have to pay extra to get grills for Kef speakers these days. Well, there you go. So uh, don't pay the extra, right. and because uh, they're Leave very, very interesting looking, and people will gravitate to, them. especially if you get the LS fifties, where the drivers like, <laughs> whether they like that red gold color or whatever. I say in the fifteen, uh, I'm sorry, fourteen by fifteen and a half uh, foot home theater room, due to the the window placement and the wall where the projection screen will go, it will be fourteen feet front to back. Does that allow for enough room to have a second row of seats at the back? Um, do, is do, I mean. You can do anything you, you can want do it. to try hard enough. <laughs> uh, they will be on the back wall. Yes. Like on the back wall. Yeah. And these will not be good seats to be and sitting in. And you would not want to get two rows of recliners. No way, no, no how. No, that will not work. Uh, this that will not this work. would be, you could have a, a sofa right against the back wall. You could definitely something like a bunch of bar stools. You know, a row of bar stools that are in behind your main row of seats. That I could certainly see because uh, that prevents you having to have a riser and it's it's easier and they're not frequently used you can move them out of the way when you don't need them so that i can get behind uh so yeah the only thing i would say you definitely can't do is two rows of recliners but if you put the first row at nine and a half feet from the front wall then you've got four and a half feet behind you you could sort of squeak in a small chair or definitely bar stools back there yeah i think, I think so i've got 19 feet in my mm. i think home theater it's 19 or 21 i can't remember and i have two rows of seats and in order to have a nice walkway behind my recliners right. which is my reclining my whole couch reclines if you recline the whole couch not even fully but if you just recline it yeah. the, the have a walkway that's comfortable uh the the couch in the back is like this cheap yeah target <laughs> little faux leather ca uh, couch thing that's tiny it's like it's not built for a child but it's not much bigger than the one that's built for a child so that would be uh yeah you're, you're really pressing it at 14 feet yeah. you're really pressing it so we said a 10 foot viewing distance with 110 inch screen would be just about perfect in there 120 inches from silver ticket is barely any more here we go barely any more expensive and this uncle likes the idea of a larger screen size would that be okay uh so to do to really to, to, first of all, he may like the idea of it, right? I like the idea of a lot of things. <laughs> you know, I, I when somebody told me that I could go to a store and get a Cuban sandwich that had two and a half pounds of meat on it, mm. I had a, I liked that idea, and then I bought it and went, I have made a terrible, terrible mistake. Mm. You know, the, this was not a good idea, and I should have thought this through. So your uncle should think it through too. He may like the idea of a bigger screen, and yes, it may only cost a little bit more. But uh, do the math. Yes, and plus the possibility that if they are going to have two rows, you might end up with the front row closer than 10 feet, eyes to screen. Yes. Then that, that can start to make a big difference. What you could actually very realistically do is go ahead and get the projector before purchasing the screen, put the projector in there, throw the image onto the wall, and find out exactly what size screen you want. Yeah, that's the easiest way to do yeah. it. But, I mean, if... You do the math and say, okay, if I'm, you know, if I'm sitting this many feet from the, the screen, say nine and a half feet, which is what Rob has kind of suggested yeah. here, nine and a half eyes to screen, which, you know, is about where you might end up being, then the horizontal or diagonal measurement would be X. Yeah. 
So what what is that you know what is that ratio you know so it's 120 inches diagonal and then you're however many inches from the screen what's that ratio now look at the, the uh, pick a TV any TV mm. right in your house and get that ratio you know and say oh, yeah. okay well this is a 55 inch screen and so in order if it's 55 inch screen then the multi you know, I multiply it out and I know that that the ratio is this so I multiply that out and now you have to stand right here this is how big yeah. 120 inches would look to you if you are sitting where we think you're going to be sitting and then you could look at it and go oh yeah this is fine or or that's uh, a pain because now I have to that, turn my head side to side to see what I'm looking at I mean, so you can do it either way. You can just buy the projector and figure it out once you get there and buy the screen second, which is easy enough to do. Or you can kind of do the do the test beforehand. So we suggested the Morant uh, SR6014 receiver from Accessories for Less, but his uncle doesn't want refurbished. What would we recommend for, uh, for a brand new receiver? I would uh, recommend refurbished because it's essentially a brand new receiver. <laughs> huh? I, I uh, we have all gotten and, and not you, Rob obviously because he's from Canada, but I have twice I think, and other people on this podcast have gotten stuff from Accessories for Less. And aside from the fact that it's fully factory refurbished and it has a full manufacturer's warranty, just as if you had bought it new, we very rarely can anybody find the blemish. Whatever it was, <laughs> the blemish is usually somebody bought it and said, I don't want this, need this, or I want something bigger, or I need something else, and they sent it back. That's the blemish. And there has been the occasional unit that we've heard about where there there was a problem, but you know it's always been taken care of. They returned it and got a replacement or had it fixed under warranty. The same thing can happen buying brand new, but I'm not going to at this point try to convince your uncle vicariously through you when you can spend a little bit more so i mean the reason i liked the sr6014 from exercise for less is it was a thousand dollars uh but for thirteen hundred dollars you can get the x3700h denon x3700h which is all the same features and it's three hundred dollars more to get the brand new but that's okay if if that's what he wants to do the 30 x3700h's are back in stock now so you just tell your uncle okay so you could get, you know, you can get the, uh, let, let, let's take, let's just take something else that you can get a gallon of milk from this <laughs> store for a dollar, or you can get a gallon of milk from this store for a dollar 30. It's the same gallon of milk. Mm -hmm. Which one are you going to go to? I'm going to buy the dollar one. Well, there you go. Go with the accessories for less and stop <laughs> being weird. So we gave a send and the SVS as our top picks for speakers in the theater. Again, can we boil it down to just one, uh, ascend because <laughs> if you're going to go svs downstairs do ascend i mean if we're going to say svs downstairs you should do something different upstairs there you that's go that's the reason See? my my yeah. thought was the convenience of order it all from one place in one go um and given the budget that he had and and how much we said to spend on the projector in this case uh i'd be going for some prime series prime series all around uh that's what's going to fit the budget he sort of asked about towers which i'm not opposed to towers when they're going on either you side sitting of a no do no don't get towers of a projector screen but yeah my my recommendation would be get to get to get prime bookshelf as your front speakers that's my recommendation yeah. if he insists on towers then the regular prime towers you don't need to go for the pinnacles in this theater you're not looking at that type of output requirement whatsoever in a 14 foot long room right so we said monoprice alpha for in the ceilings monoprice initially suggested the caliber series to him can either aim the tweeters is doing so even desirable go to av gadgets <laughs> please yeah. and read the article on uh best atmos speakers okay. for your theater or whatever and it ha specifically says don't buy aimable yeah it's it's the stuff. opposite of desirable i i really dislike in ceiling speakers that let you independently aim the tweeter you you can't do that and have proper dispersion characteristics when the woofer is and and cabinet <laughs> like either right. all of it moves or none of it should that's really and there the are to be. some speakers out there that you can get that where all of it moves. right they exist but they all move and then the mechanism that allows it to move uh -huh. basically is an open <laughs> is an open slot yes into right. the, the 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 seat the the attic or ceiling or whatever i'm like you it's a port there's a port That's in this right. thing. They have a port here. You know, I it's a terrible design. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I agree with Rob. The whole if you look at okay, 
And if you look at what Dolby was actually trying to do with Atmos, what their thought process was, I believe, is there's a lot of rich people who bought their <laughs> you know houses and they had their stupid seal their, their you know person put all the speakers in the ceiling fronts lefts rights mm-hmm. surrounds all of them are in the ceilings so like what if we convinced them to buy speakers that went on the ground and then we can made all of those into the Atmos speakers it wouldn't be exactly the right spot but they <laughs> you could at least use them so those speakers were already designed almost exclusively to be firing straight down right. because they were just in ceiling speakers nobody really built a whole ton of speakers that had aimable tweeters there were some out there but there weren't a ton of them and honestly like reb said you know when you if you think about how uh dispersion characteristics of the of the of the the speakers work where you know basically the sound goes out in waves in the cone shape mm-hmm. you know you want the cones all to be kind of facing the same direction or they you know you you <laughs> not you the mis- most directional ones pointing off in a different space than the thing right. that they're nestled in the middle of so and, yeah. and and even then as a as a speaker designer and that's the funny thing people are like well should i get atmos speakers that match my i'm like what do you mean try to find <laughs> in ceiling speakers that are sonically matched Kef comes pretty no, close timbre matched Kef can do it Th- they are probably the only ones that can, but you know, even then, you're still looking at a speaker that is compromised as far as its enclosure. You know, it goes into a ceiling that you have to have a back box included, and then that back box is usually trying to be as small as possible, which means you're, you're there's just all sorts of compromises. Yeah. That anyway, I so. I directly answer the question, say go for the Alpha series. I that there are better components in there. I know they cost a little bit more, but not crazy much more because it's mono price. So, uh, and right. those have the metal I back hands. Twenty bucks. Yeah, yeah, those have the metal back hands instead of plastic. So I would go for the Alpha series. Yeah. So we said to spend more than half of the ten thousand dollar theater budget on the JAVC NX five projector. For some reason, Dale's uncle wants to know if there's something with even better video quality and how much more uh, would it cost to get it. Um, I, I don't twenty grand. <laughs> <laughs> 20 grand I think. even then i'm like uh you're not really getting the like uh dynamic tone mapping the frame by frame dynamic right. tone i mean i guess you could go up to the nx9 i would have to say that yes the nx9 is an upgrade over the nx5 but uh yeah well that is yeah you're about it's about eighteen thousand dollars so you know you had a ten thousand dollar budget do you want to spend 180 percent of your budget just on the projector in a room where it makes no sense to deploy that model of projector i don't understand this question i have no idea what he's thinking he would be getting that would be better than the nx5 so the nx5 is it and even that is spending more than i would normally spend given this budget but i think it's really worth it so there you go so if you wanted to get something that was technically better than the this JVC, I think you would have to go with an OLED. I see. And then and then sit either get like <laughs> spend a ridiculous amount of money to get something big enough or sit a whole lot closer. Okay, so In which like case the, your second row of seats ma- suddenly makes a lot more sense. The 83 inch that's coming up, maybe like the Sony yeah. A90J yeah. uh 83 and then inch move OLED. Your couch up like 2 feet. Yeah. 3 feet. Two and a half feet. You know, sit seven feet away from it, and then your couch behind you, you know, has plenty of. I mean, that that's gonna <laughs> have... that's gonna be seven or eight thousand dollars. So we still increased the budget. <laughs> there you go. Woo-hoo. Get the OLED. for a smaller size. That's, he that's, wanted one hundred and twenty, and now we knocked it down to eighty three and spent more. Uh, the, the NX five. Don't man, ask that's... a question if you don't want the answer. I, know, right? I told you the answer. The answer is I, the only thing better than the JVC is an OLED. I don't know so this, get the like, OLED. I have a ten thousand dollar budget. We said to spend more than half of it on this projector. He's like, can I get even better for even more money? I I don't understand that one, but anyway. you could actually pay the actors to come in and recreate it for you, right. like live. <laughs> It's my one man. It's Tom Cruise's one man show. It cost me one hundred twenty thousand dollars for one night. Uh, I don't know if this is for Dale or Dale's uncle, but he's requesting what's the most reasonable OLED TV choice? C series from LG. You could definitely grab a C10 right now, or wait for the C1 if you happen to want that eighty three inch size at the most affordable. But that's the most reasonable OLED is a C series from LG. What's the very best LCD TV choice to compete? Ooh, I'm gonna say Q series, the Q QLEDs from Samsung. Or the Sony's. I mean, I think it's the Sony's, and and honestly, the one I, we don't know for sure because it's not out yet; it hasn't been tested. But based on last year's and now what's being added to this year's, I think 
the upcoming, let's see, what is it going to be called? X95J. Because we had the X950 series last year that didn't get a, any of the HDMI 2.1 stuff. For some reason, that was only in the step-down X900H series, which made the X900H exceedingly popular. But now mm. the little bit better picture quality and all the HDMI 2.1 features are going to be in the X95J series. And I tend to go that way because I think... I personally feel overall the Sonys are better than the Samsungs. Even though they don't have as many local dimming zones, they handle the shadow detail and the color accuracy and they have Dolby Vision and all that stuff. No, no, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of excited about the QNEDs. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of zones. It is? It's <laughs> a lot of zones. But we'll see how it turns so out. So one of those two, yeah. Uh, yeah top of the line, QNED, or, or no, Q... Uh, what is it? Uh, 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 Neo QLED. That's the that's Neo the QLED. Yeah. Top of the line Neo QLED or the top oh, of the line LG. top of the line 4K from Sony the X ninety five J. LG is the QNED. LG I is the QNED, now. and I wouldn't the want Neo QLED. I wouldn't want yeah. the the QNED from LG because it's still an IPS panel, and <laughs> the people who right. got to see them in person, uh, very few who did. They're like, yeah, they still look like butt. So. <laughs> okay. So the highest value choice, uh, assuming a lower price than OLED, the highest value choice, it's got to be TCL, right? I would say Vizio. I would say that, that oh, P yeah. Quantum X, like right. that 85 inch P Quantum X, which is $2,500 for an 85 inch P Quantum X now. Is it's, it still 2500 bucks? I, I thought that was a was sale. was the last time I looked. But anyway, 3000 at the most. You can't beat that for value. Can't. Hmm. And what would we suggest for an outdoor TV? A window. <laughs> <laughs> just look in just look into the good tv that's on the inside it's pretty tough yeah i mean uh, there's the dedicated outdoor tvs that are supposed to be kind of weather resistant but they're crazy expensive i think it makes yeah. more sense to have a shield and put a cheap right. tv in there now that like there i i would go tcl6 series because they can get shockingly bright for very little money and that's what matters outside and if it does get damaged they were so darn cheap you don't even care about replacing it you could replace a tcl6 series outside 15 times over before you equal the price of one dedicated outdoor tv right yeah they're pretty expensive yeah. uh I mean, it would be much, much cheaper just to buy, like Rob said, uh, or have made a, some sort of enclosure for it. Yeah. Uh, and then just cycle the TVs in and yep. out. Like, I, we've, heard, we've had people saying, well, I, you know, I want something that I can take the TV inside, take it outside, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, you're not going to do that. You're not going to. Yeah. <laughs> just put a cheap one out there that you don't care if it breaks. Yep. Ken. Ken asks, can we please clarify the situation with Dolby Vision on projectors? Can any projectors accept a Dolby Vision signal natively? Can any projectors show it? And what about using an HD Fury to spoof the EDID information? Would you be seeing in genuine Dolby Vision images on a projector with that method? So the thing about Dolby Vision is that no projector can anticipate what sort of brightness you're going to get off of your screen off the screen, it projects upon you. Don't, it doesn't know if you're using a ambient light rejecting it. You don't know. It doesn't know what the you know uh, what the gain is on your screen. It doesn't know how far away it's going to be. And know any of those things, which means Dolby Vision doesn't work for it. And that's why there's no projectors out there except for that one, which I think ended up not actually. They had to working. retract it. Yeah, it was like a, a Chinese brand that said right. they supported it, and then uh, apparently Dolby found out about that, and they're like, "Yeah, we don't have it anymore." So, I mean, to answer directly, there are no projectors. With Dolby Vision, uh, there are no projectors where if you plug in a Dolby Vision source, there's going to be a Dolby Vision logo that lights up and says you're in Dolby Vision mode. That is not the case for any projectors, uh, so they, none of them can take a Dolby Vision signal natively and show it. Now, there is yeah. the thing that the HD Fury devices are doing. Uh, now, what you have to do there, and I mean, you, you can basically go through the AVS forum threads where people have... Uh, looked at several popular projector models and said, here's how you need to set it up. Because what it essentially does is inside the HD Fury, it targets a certain HDR10 output. So the what shows up at the projector uh, is still an HDR10 signal. But it's an HDR10 signal where that was the target in the HD Fury and the HD Fury takes the Dolby Vision signal, and the Dolby Vision signal has to be th what they call player-led, which means right. that it is not a static, well, 
well, yeah, it's not a static Dolby Vision signal that is coming out of the source device and then being manipulated by the display to the display's capabilities. It's one where the source device, your playback device, was given some information saying, here's what the display can do. Now you, the source device, adjust the Dolby Vision output on the fly to match the capabilities of the television. So that's why you have to put all of that information into the HD Fury. So now the HD Fury can tell your source device, like your Apple TV 4K or your Ultra HD Blu-ray player that has player-led Dolby Vision, here's the display you're connecting to, here's what the display can do, adapt your output on the fly for that, and then it puts that into an HDR10 container and feeds it to the projector. So does it work? Yes, as long as you set all the parameters in the HD Fury correctly so that it matches the capabilities of your projector and screen. You have to know what type of nits you're getting off of your screen because that's going to change based on ambient light conditions and what projector you're using and the screen gain and all of that. So you get those figures correct and plug them into the HD Fury and this does work. Uh, but yes, only with player-led sources and your projector's never going to say Dolby Vision on it. Right. And because of that, and, and we've talked about this before in the podcast, that my thought is that someday either it'll be a, an installer only option where installers will be able to to activate a Dolby Vision mode uh, in your in a in specific models of projectors that will require them to do exactly what Rob said, which is to make, take measurements at the screen, yeah. plug that into the projector so the projector can then accept Dolby Vision. Or their project projectors themselves will have some sort of you know light meter that can measure the light from the projector you know coming off the screen you know at the projector or something you plug in sort of mm -hmm. like a the measurement microphone uh, so that you could do the exact same thing but until that you're allowed to do that or able to do that from home which I honestly feel like is going to be the next thing for projectors. Mm. I feel like integrating Dolby Vision is I mean, the most logical step. Or they could all just get on board with what JVC has done and do frame by frame dynamic tone mapping. LG's projectors do that too. So I mean that yeah, I would rather I, I, don't, I would rather they don't do it know. that way. I know that I know that you're and you're right. I think you're right in that this is that is just as good, if not better. Yeah. But I think Adding a new th logo to the You're bottom right. of the projector want to see is what is, yeah. is what people want to see, Fair and enough. that's what I think they're going to try to give. Could them. be. So he's building a large entertainment room in his basement, roughly twenty-one by thirty-one feet, bar, pool table, poker table, and about one third of the space for a surround sound setup. He has another room in the house for a fully dedicated theater, so this doesn't have to be doesn't have to serve as a his primary movie watching setup. He has a Marantz uh, AV eight eight zero two A. 13.2 channel pre-pro on hand plus several external amps. He's picturing a 5.2.4 setup for the one-third uh, area uh, in the basement plus a TV in the bar and in-ceiling speakers over the pool table and poker table for music. Will the AV802 be sufficient for handling all of that? It's got zone 2 HDMI out so it can feed both the theater area and the TV in the bar? Question mark. And could it handle sending a signal to the in-ceiling speakers too? So if I don't, it's got 13 channels, right? Uh, yeah, you know, I better look that up because I'm trying to remember if if it really does. It's nine. Um, I know the 8805 does, but if the 8802A was 13 channels or was it uh, was it 11? So if it's got <laughs> I'm nine, to, I'm trying if, to remember if you, now. If you're using nine backwards. channels in the main system. I mean, yeah. you can use uh, a number of ways to, to handle this. It kind of depends on how many different sources you want playing all at the same time. My thought here is that the you really just need a, two zones. You need the main zone for the home theater and a zone two for the everything else. Because right. whatever's playing in the bar that on the TVs is what you're going to want to hear, right? Uh, the uh, the overhead speakers, um, I wouldn't imagine that you're going to want to hear music coming out of the overhead speakers and then the game coming out of the TV. If that's the case, then maybe you could have you would need three zones for that. But uh, that's the maximum I can see you really needing. So uh, it, it does have the 13 channels like, uh, yeah, so so you could do this since you're doing 5.2.4 in the theater. Uh, you could nine channels there. You could use zone two for one of the other ones and then zone three for one of the other ones. This could all be connected. But the issue 
that is a factor here. If one of your ideas was that you would have 5.2.4 going in the theater setup in this large room and then have the same source, like let's say you've got a you know football game going, have the same source playing from the in-ceiling speakers and the same or a different source playing from the uh, TV in the bar. With the AV8802, AV8802A, it does not have the ability to keep playing immersive audio in the theater and down mix that same source to two channel. Um, it doesn't have that ability. The newest one, the AV8805, does have that ability, but the 8802A did not. So what you would either end up with is, if you want all the zones playing the same source at the same time, they would all end up stereo. Now, you can still upmix that stereo signal in the theater area, but you wouldn't be getting discrete surround sound or discrete immersive audio in the theater and be able to play that same source out of the zone right. two and the zone three. You can you can play the same source out of all three zones, but it would be stereo in all of them, and you'd have to upmix in the theater. If you want to play different sources, this can totally work, uh, as right. long as you have stereo sources plugged into the AV8802A, and that's what's feeding zone two and zone yeah. three. I don't really see that being a, the up mixing. I don't think I don't see as being much of a I know, problem. I if it's on in the background, you, it's like football game in the background, and you just happen to be up mixing the stereo signal well, in the theater. Like that's okay. And the, even in, even if like it's much louder in the in the theater area, that's where people are sitting. But they want to be able to not miss the game as they're walking through the mm. room. No one cares. <laughs> I mean, the, the sound coming from the other parts of the room is going to mess up the discreteness of whatever you might be getting from Atmos or, you know, if it's just surrounded and up mixed from surround or whatever right. it is. You know, it's going to mess all that up anyway. So I don't really see that being much of an yeah. issue. Yeah, Funct At least functionally I don't so. this can work. And the only other thing is, again, if you wanted to show the same video signal from the TV in the bar and the display in the theater, then those displays just have to have like whatever lowest common denominator is, right? If you happen to get uh, a non-HDR TV for the TV uh, in the bar, but an HDR capable projector or an HDR capable display in the theater, then you wouldn't be able to show HDR on one of them and the same source in standard dynamic range on the second one. If you're showing the same source on both TVs at the same time, it has to be the same signal going to both. Right. Uh, but again, probably not really an issue. You know, yeah. But, or the other thing is, you can get cheap 4K HDR capable TVs to go in the bar these days, so it's really not a problem. Right. Well, I guess the other way he could do it too is if you just bought a second receiver and had that power. Yes, that could go in zone too. Zone two, yeah. So he set the zone two out to there, and yes. then it would take whatever you, you, you know, it would take your 4K, whatever, yeah. and then you would. And if you did that, had a second receiver that was connected to the zone two output, then you could keep immersive audio going in the theater because that second receiver yeah. can take the full immersive signal that's coming from the HDMI zone two and then do whatever it does with it as a sec completely separate second receiver. So that's right. It, then it, you would use its zone two for right. the overhead speakers or whatever. Yeah. Christian. Christian is just trying to make sense of the uh, the whole light output issue if you have an anamorphic lens versus just zooming a projector. To be clear, he's not arguing with us. It just isn't quite making sense to him yet, so he wants to figure it out. Fair enough. What's made, he, he, what's made it more confusing is that he went over to Projector Central and used their projection calculator. It has the option to set the aspect ratio, including with or without anamorphic lens, and then it calculates your expected light output in either foot Lamberts or nets based on the screen gain that you enter. So he, pl he tried plugging in some numbers with uh, with a JVC NX7 as the choice of projector, and he kept the screen, size, screen width throughout. If he toggles anamorphic lens versus no anamorphic lens, the projector calculator said the anamorphic lens setup would be about 25% brighter in foot Lamberts. Can we clarify the situation? Uh, yeah, so I wrote about this. Rob has talked about this. But essentially, the, the gist of it is uh, when they they look at these calculations, they are not taking into account the fact that when you zoom, uh, I guess it's zoom out. I Let's say works, go right? towards the wide angle side so that right. the images get the projector hasn't moved, but the image got bigger on the screen. Yeah. When they when they do that, you gain light output. You're opening mm -hmm. the, 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 the aperture opens yes. and that allows more light out and they do don't factor that in when they talk about well, this to be difference. Completely fair on the projector central calculator that is factored in 
Um, so yeah, so I mean that that is part of it. When when you say okay, you fix the position, you fix the the distance between the projector and screen, but then you change the zoom so that the image either gets larger or smaller. In that readout of how many nits or how many foot Lamberts, you actually have to work the calculation backwards. <laughs> but if you do, right. then it does indicate that at the wide angle setting where the uh, image got larger, it is saying there are more lumens coming out of the projector at that point. And when you go towards the telephoto side and the image gets smaller, it's saying there are, uh, is it less lumens or fewer lumens? Forget if you're talking about that, if you're know. allowed to use the word less grammatically. But anyway, the number is smaller. I think it's fewer. Yeah, like a sphere. not not as many lumens are coming out when you go towards the telephoto side. So that is factored in uh, to the projector central calculator. Now, the easy... Okay, if you just want the, the fast answer to this, it is that they are using uh, in their calculation the lumens that are coming out with it set to the wide angle side where the, the image was bigger. It was zoomed so that the image was bigger. And then they are applying in their calculation a vertical squeeze anamorphic lens, not a horizontal stretch, a vertical squeeze. So they have it where coming out of the projector, it's already the width of the cinema, cinemascope screen, but it's casting light above and below it. And then they're putting it through an anamorphic lens that squeezes the image vertically. So it keeps the width the same, but now brings all of that light into a smaller square footage area because it squeezed it vertically. So that is the major reason why the Foot Lambert or Knit figure that they're showing shows a greater increase applying that anamorphic lens because it's actually the same number of lumens as when you had the bigger image and the more lumens coming out, but applied to a smaller square footage because it's a vertical squeeze. Now we don't normally use vertical squeeze anamorphic lenses because when it's 16 by nine time and you take the anamorphic lens out of the light path, you would end up with a bigger 16 by nine and you would have to zoom the projector towards the telephoto end to get your 16 by nine image to fit into the height of your cinemascope screen. And most people don't do that. Most people, what they're doing is they set the zoom and the distance of their projector once. So that's gonna be 16 by nine fits into the height of their cinemascope screen. And then they apply a horizontal stretch anamorphic lens so that the projector and the zoom didn't change but now it stretches it widthwise to fit a cinemascope screen so that means most people are using the lower lumen number they're using the telephoto end with the lower mm -hmm. lumen number and then stretching it to fit a larger amount of square footage same number of lumens the number of lumens didn't change but it's now being stretched across a bigger screen so there's that that is the easiest Part of the, even though that wasn't super easy, but that is the easiest part of the answer is that they're applying vertical squeeze, which isn't the typical case. Then there are some other factors. He specifically did an NX7. The NX7 is a little bit of an outlier uh, for average projector because it happens to have really good lenses in it where it loses less light when you telephoto zoom it than most projectors do. Most projectors are going to lose at least 15%, usually closer to 20% when you do the, it's like a 1.35 times zoom. Most are doing that. The NX7, because it has such excellent lenses in it, only loses like 12 to 15%. That's a little bit unusual. So if we're talking specifically about the NX7, it is true that if you put an anamorphic lens, even a horizontal stretch, like most people would, it would be brighter at that point than just zooming it to fill the full width of a cinemascope screen. I can't argue with it. No matter how I work the numbers, it is gonna be brighter on an NX7 specifically with an anamorphic lens. Not quite as much as the figure you were seeing because again, they were applying vertical squeeze, not horizontal stretch. So I took the example of like an Optima UHD 60, super popular DLP projector and one where people very well might want to use anamorphic lens instead of zoom because it doesn't have motorized zoom and it doesn't have lens memories. So that's exactly the type of case where you're gonna slide the lens in and out of the light path instead of zooming the projector. On that one, you are losing like, 
even by their figures, seven, 16, 17% in real life when people have measured it, it's closer to 20%. So when you do that and you apply horizontal stretch, uh, the numbers end up, if you zoomed, just zoomed, no lens, just zoomed the projector uh, to fill the CinemaScope screen, I was doing it with a screen that's 115 inches wide, you'd have 21 foot Lamberts at that point out of an Optima UHD 60. If you did it with the lens instead, the anamorphic lens instead, you'd get 23 foot Lamberts. So yes, by no matter how I work the numbers, it's a little bit brighter, tiny little bit brighter with the anamorphic lens, but it's two foot Lamberts. It's not the sort of 25% figure that uh, you might've been thinking of. So the other thing that Rob's, uh, you know, like Rob's crunching the numbers and yes. giving you the numbers, but the reality is, is if you ever really read a review or read a user uh, who has actually had the option of taking the same projector or a similar projector and using an anamorphic and then measuring and then not using the right. anamorphic and then measuring, you'll find that universally they say, the brightness is like almost exactly the same. Like I can't tell a difference. Like I can measure a difference, but I can't tell a difference. And not only that, one thing that they don't often mention is that the distance to the screen can change significantly between using the anamorphic lens and not using it. Like the anamorphic lens oftentimes makes you be further back. There is a like you have distance for the focus of the anamorphic lens too. And if right. you aren't in that ideal range, you're going to end up with a slightly out of focus image, which is way worse. Right. So if you if you get the anamorphic lens set up, you oftentimes are uh, forced to move your projector further back, which makes it dimmer. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you don't, you can move the projector forward and it can be it will be just brighter because of how much closer it is. So when you factor all the different things in. It becomes a wash in, in in real world scenarios. The difference in brightness. Now, I'm not saying that there's not a reason to want, own, or <laughs> lust after an anamorphic setup. There is no reason you can't have one, or want one, or buy one, or love one, or whatever. But don't come at me with the brightness <laughs> argument because it doesn't hold I up. I mean, not in real. Objectively world. speaking, the the numbers are there. Where yes, it probably will be a little bit bright, like measurably a little bit brighter. But it's just it's not the big advantage that is sometimes touted. Uh, in in terms of being a big fan of anamorphic lenses, I can't think of someone who is more on board with CinemaScope screens and anamorphic lenses than Josh Zyber when he was writing for High Def Digest. He had a ton of articles about it huge fan and proponent of it one of his later articles before he left high def digest was how he's like yeah i'm at the point where i'm just not using an anamorphic lens anymore and i'm like there was never a bigger fan and and he goes yeah. through the whole process of how he arrived at it. he's like yeah I, i've got a jvc i think he has an nx7 he's like using the zoom method it just it just works yeah yeah Patricio and James and Daz all had similar questions, so we shoved them together. Mm -hmm. So Patricio lives in Texas, so he went through the horrible power outages and freezing temperatures, and I'm sorry yes. that you guys went through that. That's um, rough time. Watching the watching the politicians backflip over each other to say well, we can't believe this happened when every <laughs> single scientist who ever worked on any of that power grid went. We've been telling you it's. It was quite painful to watch, and I'm sorry that you guys suffered through that. And I have much family that's down there, too, so, you know, I heard a lot of it firsthand. Richard lives in Texas, so he went through the horrible, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Obviously, a battery backup isn't going to keep things running for a whole week, but he is very interested in having more than just a surge protector now. And he'd also like to make sure his Ethernet connection from his modem to his router is surge protected as well. I hear you, brother. Mm -hmm. He's got most of his gear in one location, receiver, two-channel amp sources, and PC, and then he has his two subwoofers and his projector plugged in to other outlets. What we recommend is battery protection for his gear. He's thinking he probably doesn't need a battery backup for his subs, but would we suggest anything for those? And what about his projector? He definitely wants protection for that, but uh, its plug is physically far away from the rest of his gear, so what works for that? So, um, yes, Rob's going to suggest a, a surge protector from, I think, ABC mm -hmm. that for the subwoofers that will allow through the full 15 amps will still surge protect and everything else. Most manufacturers will tell you don't plug in the surge protector 
for the reason that most surge protectors will uh, limit the the, mm -hmm. the amount of power that your sub gets. The one that he's going to suggest will not limit the power that your sub gets, and it's perfectly fine. I will tell you, in a place like Florida, where we have uh, power outages many, many times a year, lightning strikes many, many times a year, I have all my subs plugged directly into the mm -hmm. wall. Okay. Uh, as far as your rack of gear, you you know, I would normally suggest a J type uh, APC. They don't exist anymore, right. <laughs> or they're being refreshed. We don't know what's going on with APC. We're very much hoping that they bring back their home theater line, but they are they seem to be right now only offering their computer uh, sine wave, yes, whatever stuff, which Rob will suggest, and they are all very good. Um, so at each of the points where you have something plugged into a wall. You need to have uh, a, some sort of protection. So in my house, uh, at my I have a, one desk that has two computers, uh, a router, and a printer, and a bunch of other stuff all plugged into it. I have an APC. The battery backup goes to the computers and to the monitors, uh, and uh, the the surge protection goes for everything else. Um, I have another spot that's actually a above the cabinets in my kitchen uh, that just kind of tucked in the back there where you can't really see it against the wall is another router, uh, 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 a T-Mobile hotspot because I have very bad T-Mobile service in my area and they sent it to me for free and uh, a speaker that I use for like my whole house audio setup. Uh, it's a Bluetooth speaker that I connect to with one of the Echo Dots that I have. And all those are plugged into an APC, much like the ones Rob is going to recommend. Uh, I made sure to get one that had, and it basically has enough power to run the internet for another 20, 30 minutes <laughs> after the power goes out. Uh, but, it all, but it has uh, an Ethernet plug. It has a cable because I have a DSL, uh, I believe, or some cable provider. So uh, the cable goes in through the APC. The any Ethernet that I might want to get from outside, which I don't use right now, can go in through the APC. And then from that there, uh, that wi hard wires all the way back to my home theater. But because it's protected at, at that point, I don't have to protect it again when it comes into the home theater. It's already been protected once. Um so and then I've got actually two surge protectors in my home theater. One that has battery, which is used for my projector, and the other one is just because I didn't have enough outlets, basically. So I have a lot of stuff plugged in here. As far as your projector is concerned, because it is far away and by itself, I'm guessing you didn't do the thing where we always suggest where you have uh, an end wall extension cord that takes from your projector back down to your your home theater rack, which means you'll have to buy another surge protector to go buy it. Uh, that has battery backup. Your battery backup for that projector only needs to be on the the order of five, seven minutes, probably. I think is probably good because uh, when the power flicks, your 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 projector is going to turn off. Your battery will kick in because it, you know, everything else in the home theater stays on, but the my at least for mine, my battery doesn't kick in fast enough to stop the projector from shutting itself down. So then what it does is it gets it gets the power from the battery that uh, that allows the fan to kick on and let it go through the cooling cycle, which takes five seven minutes max. And then if the power is still off, well, you're, everything's still off. No problem. If the power is back on, well, then you, after the cooling cycle, you can turn your projector back on and you're back to watching your movie. So, so what you got, Rob? I will say the uh, back UPS Pro BR1350MS. And uh, so, yeah, you want to look for BR at the beginning. Those are the current ones. I know you're going to find other back UPS units that look exceedingly similar. Uh, and they start with like a BN or a BT, I think, or some of them. Uh, you want the ones that is BR in the model name. And the 1350MS is certainly the, it's the middle choice. And it is certainly the most uh, like value oriented. You don't really need the 1500 volt amp for hardly any systems and the 1000 that has uh, lower battery capacity is like $25 less expensive so it's worth getting the middle one the 1350ms it does have gigabit ethernet protection it does have coaxial in and out as well six battery backup outlets for surge only and that's a great unit to use on any of your main home theater gear uh, for surge only 
perhaps for your subwoofers, the uh, APC P8V is the surge strip, the one that I always recommend that lets through the full 15 amps. And then, yeah, for your projector, I you, you could get like the BR1000MS for your projector because the smaller battery makes sense when it's a single device that you're going to use, or you could install a male inlet uh, by your uh, other gear so that your projector can also plug into your BR1350MS uh, male inlet and then Romex inside your wall to a regular female outlet up by your projector. Uh, that would be the way to handle that. Yep. There you go. Second question. James uh, was reading up on uninterruptible power supplies. Uh, battery versus no battery is obvious, but what about all the other features that are mentioned? Uh, protection against voltage sags and over voltages, line noise filtration, independent power banks, blah, blah, blah. EMI and RFI projection. It seems like if you get a battery backup UPS, you automatically get all those other features too. But for pieces of gear that don't need a battery backup, should you worry about any of those features? Will a normal surge protector provide some subset of those features? Is there any risk in not having all of them? Uh, the major thing you want is surge. Yep. <laughs> uh, the RFIMI ah. protection, filtration, line noise filtration. Like this, these are problems that if you had them, you would not be asking us if you needed mm. protection from them <laughs> because your surge yeah, protector it, isn't it's really obvious. really the place. I mean, Mario, our electrician who writes to us often, will be like, proper grounding in your house is what should handle that. You shouldn't be looking yeah, yeah, yeah. to a, a surge strip to take care of those things. You need proper grounding if you have any of those issues. Right. Honestly, yeah. I mean, the the two things I care about are surge protection. That is a real thing. You can. I mean, that can that be within your house itself. That can have nothing to do with the external world, but it certainly can be the case like if your power was out and then it kicks back on there can be that sudden influx of current and that can be a problem so surge protection is a real thing you want that battery for things that you want a battery is pretty cut and dry that's obvious the rest of it i yeah i i certainly wouldn't avoid a surge protector when i don't need a battery because it doesn't mention all of these other things no as long as it has right i would agree with yeah. that 100 yeah, percent. that's it yeah yeah I mean, so mine has voltage regulation. Both of them do uh, voltage regulation on them. And I see it sometimes go up to 122 or it's saying nah, the incoming is 122. It goes down to like 117 and I'm like, nothing in my theater sounds like it has it devices cares are one iota. Definitely <laughs> able to handle that amount of fluctuation. Trey, Trey, Trey recently, there was no DAS in that. Was there a DAS in there someplace? He was just asking for which battery backup to buy. So with the uh, BRM1350MS. Uh, all right, all right, good. Trey, Trey recently bought a Denon X4700H receiver and that kind of ate up his budget. He liked to install four Atmos speakers, but he's in a rental. So he wants on ceiling rather than in ceiling and on a tight budget under $200 for all four. So what he's hoping for, he found some slim on wall rock fill speakers on Amazon, would they be fine for Atmos or should you be looking for something else? The rest of the speakers are all Klipsch. Let me look at these speakers. Yeah, so um, specifically the Rockfills that he linked to, you would not want to because they are 70 volt speakers. They are low voltage uh, install speakers that are that do not have the correct inputs to connect to an AV receiver. Uh, so those ones specifically- I see the back of these things. Yeah. I don't know what that means. Those ones specifically- oh, There's no picture of the back. There's no, there's no speaker wire inputs. <laughs> They're very thin. They're very thin. So along yeah. those lines, if you want something that's the same form factor and actually the same price of only $60 a pair, I have no idea how they sound. I don't anticipate them sounding good. I am not saying this as a recommendation. I'm just saying such a thing exists and actually connects to speaker wire instead of a low voltage signal like would normally run your LED lights. Um, there is a company called Acoustic Audio. They have their slm one double. You, uh, which are available on Amazon, same price, same form factor as the Rockfields, but are designed to work with an actual speaker wire input. I have no idea if they're even sufficient for Atmos, uh, but if that was the only thing you were going by was form factor and price, those are there. As for something I might actually point you toward, for this type of price range, I would point you to some Yamaha all-weather speakers, because I'm pretty sure he wanted white, and... If you go with the Yamaha AW190s, they're $100 for a pair. So you can get the two pairs for the $200 budget that you had. And they're white and they come on a swivel mount. So you can put them on the wall or put them on the ceiling and aim them however you like. And I think that's the way I would go. Uh, over at Accessories for Less, they have uh, Deftex. Um, let's see, which one are they? The uh, Pro Monitor 
400s. They've got those for 50 bucks each. Uh, so very small, easy to mount, 50 bucks each fits the budget. Uh, so that's another option, but they're only in black. So if you wanted white, I'd probably get those Yamaha all-weather speakers. Yeah, those are weird the acoustic audio ones. I don't I know. think that they have a keyhole mount, yeah. and then there's no way to run... The, it, it looks like it would mount it flush to the wall, mm. but then there's no way to run the cable <laughs> behind the speaker. Like there's no channel for it. Ah. And then the the spring loaded things are yes. they're spring loaded tabs, but and they're inset. But yeah. it, so the speaker it, wire has, to be, it's has come, to be in the wall. Yeah, it has to be like ninety. Yeah, it, it assumes really that you you drilled a hole yeah. behind exactly where the speaker is. Yeah. Yeah, it's very strange. You would have to put like museum putty or maybe like rubber bumpers yeah. at all four points on it in order to, and then have the 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 screw that you're gonna keyhole mount it with. Basically, it's yeah. Not I'm not saying very... I'm a big fan of it. I'm just saying they are they are literally the same look as those Rockville speakers in the same price, right? Uh, with something that would actually work with an AV receiver. If you want to take a gamble on it, I mean, Amazon will survive if you return them. But um, I'm more That's in right. favor of those Yamaha all weather speakers, to be honest. AW one night. I have been uh, I have been very very uh, cognizant recently about whether or not something can be re returned from free yes. to Amazon <laughs> lately because I've gotten burned a couple ah. times where I was not paying attention. Bertrand in Quebec. Quebec. <laughs> Bertrand's theater build is really coming along, he says. The carpet is now installed. The electrical is completed. And his first coat of black paint has been applied. He's held off on completing his gear purchases until the room is ready, but now he's getting close. Mm -hmm. First, a tip from any fellow uh, DIY acoustic panel builders. Make sure the wood you buy for the frame is, is straight. <laughs> Uh, that is true unless you are like me and you actually cut the panel and then build the wood around ah. it. Like you cut the wood around it, then you're like, oh, this is warped. I'll put the warp on the inside mm -hmm. and it just kind of works. But I am also cut first, regret later kind of guy. <laughs> so so we talk about making the making sure the fabric you use for your DIY panels is acoustically transparent, using the breath test to easily tell if you're just picking out a fabric at a store. But are you supposed to be able to blow on the fabric and literally not have it move? He's tried it with some Gulford of Maine fabric that uh, all the panel makers use, and the fabric still moved when he blew on it. So how's the breath test actually supposed to work? Uh, at, it's, I mean, it's going to move. It's yes, not, even if you blew on speaker the, grill cloth that you can see through, let alone let yes, uh, sound yeah. through, uh, if, if you just hold it limply in front of you and blow on it, the fabric will move. So it's not that that amount it's of not air. That, okay, I mean, it's not like invisible <laughs> right. to, yes. to, to, to air. But as you hold it tightly to your yes. face, I mean, it doesn't have to be super tight, but tightly to your face and blow through it. Yes. Okay. Do you feel resistance? You feel the air coming back at you that resistance you are you are you having to push the air through or you exhale or blow and it doesn't feel like there's anything in front of your face yeah. that's acoustically transparent yeah so that's how and it, it doesn't have to be 100 percent. it should just be that you know you hold the fabric with both hands pretty much taut in front of your face you try to blow air through it and air can go through the fabric i mean there's some fabric where you blow through it and no air comes out the other side yeah so it has to be breathable. <laughs> I swear you guys don't you guys won't believe me, but I have also written an article on how to do this huh. <laughs> recently. It's just not it's in queue to get published, but it's not. Uh, so okay, so for those of you who aren't writers, or maybe you do write, you know, for work or whatever, you know that you if you write something and then you read it again right afterwards you can't edit it properly at least most people can you, you you'll you'll miss some things mm. so what i do is i write a bunch of articles and then i let them age so that they're far enough away that i've I don't remember them exactly what exactly what I wrote, so I'm not reading what I thought I wrote. I'm reading what I actually wrote. So I so because I'm editing my own mm -hmm. stuff, which makes it hard. In fact, while we were doing this podcast, I just saw an, a, a mistake and I had to go back and fix it while we were talking. So um, you know, I I still miss stuff. So a lot of these I've got like you know at least five to. 10 articles at any time already written there. I'm just letting sit there so that I can make sure that I, I catch as many of the mistakes as I can. And one of them is, is how to tell a cloth is acoustically <laughs> transparent. So how do we uh, suggest building DIY panels so they have an air gap? Are there special mounts to buy? The employees at this local hardware store weren't much help. Uh, this is, you're overthinking it. Uh, the easiest way to do this is to, if you're gonna build a two inch panel, 
buy a one by four. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Basically. Uh, and then mount the, the panel material, the acoustic Insulation. material on one yeah. side. And then mount the 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 other side to the wall, and you could just use, and this is what I use, uh, just buy a kit that has uh, picture hanging materials in it, which are you know little uh, eyelets with uh, wire, yep. and you, you you screw them in by hand, which is easy to do, and then you tie the wire on, and you hang them like a picture. Yeah, just make the. And then you, I would put. Yeah, go ahead. Just, just just make the frame deeper than the insulation itself, and then yes. now you automatically have an air gap because the insulation is not as deep as the frame. That's right. And then you would put either museum putty or uh, rubber yeah. acoustic tape, uh, not acoustic, uh, rubber insulation tape at all four corners so that it doesn't vibrate on the wall and bobs. Now, if you happen to already build your panels, because he said he already got the framing material and all that, so if you built it so that the frames are the same depth as your insulation, but you still want an air gap. Little blocks of wood at the corners. Little blocks of wood yep. at each corner, and now you attach those to the wall instead, or or string your picture hanging wire across the little blocks of wood, and now you've made an air gap. The little blocks, no matter where you you you, you put this the the wire, yeah. as long as it's long enough to reach to the, the hook on the wall. That's right. Know, the little blocks of wood to hold it off the wall. So little yeah. little standoffs. Actually, reminds that's me all of, we're talking about. Uh, <laughs> When I'm uh, when I'm making bagels, which I make bagels sometimes, uh, I don't have a lot of room. In my, I have a lot. Of, I have two refrigerators, but I have three boys, so I don't have a lot of room. So what I'll do is I'll take and I'll make a because it usually makes two two sheet pans of uh, bagels, and they have to uh, uh, proof overnight in the refrigerator. So what I do is I put one in there, and then I'll take just stacks of Legos and put them in there, so I can put another right. one on top. Right, and it just. You know, same difference, basically. So he's got super chunk base traps in the corners and panels on all four walls. But since the room was only 11 and a half feet wide and a little over 14 feet long and seven and a half high, his Martin Logan motion series speakers will be very close to the super chunks, only about six inches from the side walls and pretty darn close to his seats. How important are all of those distances? For example, if we, we really think he needs more than six inches from the side walls, that might impact his final decision on screen size. I mean, you put throw those things in the corner uh, as long as y if you really want to. So the way he's got this thing sort set up right here, from what I can see, what? That's no, those are diffusers. Okay, speaker. No, I can't understand what I'm seeing here. TV. Oh yeah, I mean the seats are pretty close to the middle. Uh, he's got his Valencia recliners, and the screen is I on the right hand okay. side. And so I mean, yeah, he's I he's now. put his towers. He's he went for towers, uh, which. We wouldn't have gone for towers in a room this size, but he went for towers. And I mean, he's got them very close to the side walls and actually spread farther apart to the sides than they need to be. Um, yeah. now, I mean, he might have been thinking ahead to, because he's, he's been talking along about he might get a projection screen in the future, but doesn't have one right now. So that might have been part of it. You don't need to have the speakers literally pointed straight at you so that zero degrees on axis is right well, at the seat. Well, all of his speakers are, are, are facing Yeah, he's got him, everything aimed right at the one how, seat. <laughs> if you look at Dolby or just about anybody else's like graphics, yes. it's really irritating. I know. I, did, I wrote an article about this as well. It's really irritating about how they they have them all facing like that middle of the of the couch yeah. and that's not the way it's supposed no, to be. No, I mean you kind of uh, want to be a little bit off axis from all of your yeah. speakers. You don't want bang on axis to any of your speakers. So, uh in the current setup, there is no reason why you can't move your left and right speakers a little bit closer together. That would probably be closer to a plus or minus 22 and a half degrees, a 45 degree spread between your front left and right speakers. So, if you do that, um, I mean, the thing is where he's proposed laying out absorption panels, um, like, I mean, because the speakers are very close to the, to the seats, uh, he doesn't have much distance to where the first reflection point would be, but he's, he's put the absorption panels on the side walls basically straight to the left and right of the seats and then just in front of that. I would, like, mm. shift all of that so that the panels are basically directly beside the speakers and... Well, like, take the ones that are directly to the left and right of your seats and move them in front <laughs> of the panels that are at the first reflection point so that they're so, directly beside the speakers instead. That's Just so everybody understands kind of what we're seeing here if yeah. you're not on YouTube. Uh, so he's got what you would think to be a, a fairly normal setup 
up front there. He's got uh, his, his uh, TV on, on the front wall. He's got a center channel likely underneath it. Yeah. Uh, but then because of the, the corner ba- uh, chunk traps, you know, the, there's no corner. It's it, it, There's triangles yeah. from floor to ceiling of insulation that will be covered. So he actually has, like on his left speaker, is almost on the wall, in f- on, on the left wall in front of that chunk mm-hmm. trap and then facing his his uh his his couch which is maybe just the way he this, this picture is laid out maybe that's not what his plan is but there's more space between the the speaker and the tv than there is the speaker and the side right. wall yes so what you and i would both suggest and if this is all the scale which it kind of looks like he did yeah, it that's what he, to he do tried to do with scale. the scale yeah uh you know the minimum i would like people's speakers to be is you know kind of directly in front of the arms of their couch Mm -hmm. right and you've got them past that when you have space to have them closer to you know uh, the 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 front of your the 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 arms of your couch i would move those speakers so they flanked your tv almost as close as you possibly i think he was really trying to get to plus or minus 30 degrees because the audio file recommendation is the you know equilateral triangle no i i would much rather have front left and right speakers at the plus or minus 22 and a half degrees the 40 and that also puts them more in line with your atmos speakers which is where they're kind of supposed to be um I would actually take your subwoofer and because he's got a front subwoofer that he has sort of in f- behind the TV somehow. Well, yeah, because he's using really a three in one works. TV stand. So the- yeah, so it's kind of behind the TV on the left side. I would take that subwoofer. And if you look at your subwoofer on the other side, right, I would take that subwoofer and put it just like right on the wall, ju- right on the left wall, just in front of that base trap. And I would take your back subwoofer and put it on the back right wall just in front of that base trap okay. so that would make them more mirrored they are not as mirrored now as they should be and could be uh but that would make them more mirrored and it would put your speaker on the other side of that and i would do the same I would, on the other on the right uh right side i would move your speaker so that was the same as your your other one i would not worry about this 30 degree crap i would have my speakers almost i, I almost guarantee you uh, you're gonna have to have them faced almost directly straight into the room, mm. but maybe just slightly tilted in yeah, just for a your little main bit of left toe and right speakers. Huge toe in right now that is basically equilateral triangle angles. And then all the Atmos speakers should be facing straight down. All the left and right speaker, the the, the, the surround speakers should be fo- uh, fired directly into the room. And I really feel like those are kind of okay place. You could yeah. maybe inch them forward a little bit, but if that's a recliner, which it kind of looks like it is, it, they're probably when you recline exactly oh, yeah, where no, they Those are fine. Be. They should be facing each other so uh yeah so yeah. you're gonna end up with i mean j- the room is not very wide so you're gonna end up with the speakers close to the side walls so yeah like i say the absorption panels i would i would instead of having them directly to your left and right i would take those ones and put them closer to the front wall <laughs> uh so keep See, the i first would take the points. so he's got like uh he's got three panels on each wall so he's got if we're going from the back of the room to the front of the room he's got a base trap in the in the back corner and then almost directly next is a panel then his surround speaker, and then panel, panel, big gap where the speaker is. But because of the angle of the speaker, those two panels are now sort of in that first reflection point area. But if he moves his speaker where we want it to be, I would take, leave your back panel where it is. I'll take your middle panel, move it a little bit forward, and take your 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 front panel and move that directly, you know, as far forward as you. Let's put it this way: you see your your rear panel where it's almost touching your base trap. I will take my front panel and almost make that touch exactly. the base trap, and I'll take the middle panel and center it between the two. There you go. <laughs> so that's how I would do it, uh, and I think that would almost certainly get you better off here. Than what you got? Okay. Uh, with the compact room dimensions, we said seal sub makes sense, but the, but at the time we sounded like we prefer SVS SB two thousand Pro models over the SB one thousand simply because they dig right down to twenty hertz. And he was totally on board with that. But now the one thousand Pro series is here, and the SB one thousand Pro is supposed to hit twenty hertz right now. So what do we say? Can he save that money, or are the SB two thousand Pros still the way to go? 
uh, I would save the money. <laughs> would yeah, totally I'm, I'm pretty on board with getting 1,000 Pros in here. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. They didn't exist it at the time. It makes it a lot easier for me to recommend the SP, the 1,000s, that's for sure. Yeah, no, they didn't exist at the time. And I was like, ah, you know, he, I mean, he's going to a lot of effort in this room. So the SB 1,000s, yeah. that are really like a 25 hertz sub. I was like, ah, are we gonna are we going to skimp there? But now the 1,000 Pro series, same price, but they're digging right down to 20 hertz, as long as we believe SVS, and we pretty much do at this point. Yeah, we do. We don't think they're going to start lying now on their CEA 2010 measurements. So uh, yeah, I think you can actually save some money here. Good timing. Good thing you waited. Good timing on that one. Uh, Chris. Chris has a Yamaha RX A3070 receiver, but only 5.2 speakers at the moment. He just picked up a pair of insulin speakers that he says he intends to install as rear Atmos speakers. It's the first time I've ever heard those words that, spoken. That's the words he used. Uh, He's got one main seat that faces uh, directly faces his TV. Then there's a love seat facing sideways along the left wall and another love seat facing sideways along the right wall. So it's kind of a square. His two surround speakers are directly to the sides of his one main seat and mounted fairly high on the side walls. His one main seat is right back against the half uh, half back wall that is created by the staircase at the very back of the room. So there's a bit of extra space behind him on his left, but no space behind him on his right. Makes me wonder how he's going to get Atmos speakers behind them, but let's just go on with that. Oh, I have seen these pictures before. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he's got one main seat. So the half wall is not half from the bottom up. It's half from the left. Oh, the right Correct. to the left. Yes. If you're looking at the, the room. So he has, it goes around. He basically exits his seat, takes a left, Takes a left, goes to the back of the room, takes a left, goes up the stairs that goes right behind the seat. Um, his surrounds are kind of right to his sides and they are very high up. And that is seemingly because he's got a video game ca cabinet right there that he's, try that he's trying to clear to get to his seat because mm -hmm. he can't really get it too much lower. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm looking at it. So for his rear Atmos speakers, would it make sense to install them directly above his one main seat, essentially his top middles, even though that would put them very close to his existing surround speakers? Should install them a little ways in front of his seats just so they have more separation from the surrounds? And this setup, where do we think Atmos speakers should go? Uh, they should stay at the store. <laughs> That's what I think. But uh, since you're going to you get them anyways, uh, I would consider... Because he's only got one sub. Or he's, no, got he's got two, two subs. subs. Yeah. We, we can't see them in I the would... photo. There's another one on the right-hand side of the room, diagonally opposite the uh, PC cylinder that's beside his arcade cabinet. Can't yeah. see it at a picture. So I would consider, and uh, you may l hate or love this idea, but I would consider... To, oh, there's a door there. I see it now. I would consider taking that sub and swapping it with an arcade cabinet. Okay, so oh, that's so going to that move a little bit lower further. the surround speakers is what you're getting at. And then I would lower the surround speakers on both sides. And then you could put them as top middles then. Okay. Uh, that's the way I would do it. And then your your subwoofer on the other side, which I'm I don't know where it is because there's a there's a it's as it's far as uh, I can... if you imagine that so if you see the single seat there, there are love seats on both the left wall and the right wall. So it's yeah. uh, in front of the love seat that's on along the right wall, like closer to the front wall. There's no image of right. it that shows it. I think that this would actually make your subs be a little bit more mirrored yeah. if you did this than less mirrored, because I think they are less mirrored than I'm than this, these pictures are letting on. So I would swap the sub and the arcade cabinet. I would lower the speaker and then I would put them as top middles. If you don't want to do that, I would put them as heights, front heights, and. Yeah. Uh, just just marvel at the lack of you ever noticing them ever. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, looking towards the future, if you were ever to get four Atmos speakers, they would be front heights and top middles. So yeah. you're either going to install top middles now and lower your surround speakers now, or you're going to keep everything where it is and install front heights now, because once you go to four overhead speakers, it's, it's going to be those two. It's going to be front heights and top middles. So pick your poison, yeah. which one you do first. That's what I would do. JR. Uh, JR is back. I didn't know he left. Oh, yes, I do. I guess I recognize this room yes. now. Yes. Last week, he described how, how he's just getting into Room Q Wizard, and he set the first measurements he had taken, which were his front, left, and right speakers playing together, along with both of his, uh, his subs with Odyssey on, which he sent to us, and we said that was wrong. So, <laughs> along with our advice, he also wrote to Gick, and we said 
Uh, we all said the same thing that we need need to see measurements of his individual speakers playing one at a time. So hmm. we have a left speaker measurement, a right speaker measurement, uh, a s dual subs below 80 hertz measurement, a left speaker with subs, pure direct. Okay, and a right speaker with subs, pure direct. This is before having received any of his GIC treatments, and this is without any RSC correct, uh, correction applied. Can we offer any insights? Boy, it would have been so much ha easier if you just put these all on, at least put the two speakers on one graph. That would have made <laughs> things a little bit easier. Uh, they look, there is a suck out in your right speaker. There's a couple of suck outs in your right speaker that look a little bit more dramatic than your uh, left, speaker, left speaker for sure yes and not that's, necessarily that's surprising me. because the left side of his room is more open than the right side of his room so right because the stairway yeah his right. right speaker is closer to being in a corner uh than his left speaker is so not super shocking that uh the left speaker has something closer to a a flatter frequency response and we're looking at so this one twelfth smooth gick is going to tell you is to put thicker panels on your right wall mm -hmm. to make up for this, uh, to more heavily treat that right wall to try to make it seem at least acoustically more like your left wall so that you get more even, uh, yeah, or at least uniform response. But as far as even, the the speaker response. measurements go, the the vast majority of the largest ups and downs for both the left speaker and the right speaker are seem to kind of go together. Yeah, it's in like yeah. the three to five hundred hertz range, which is very much a acoustically treatable range with right. uh, with panels. So that's in a way it's good news because you're you're. Uh, if you want to call them problems or or non-linearities in the measurements of your speakers is primarily in a frequency range that acoustic treatments very much address. So, um, yeah, I, I would anticipate that adding your gig treatments will be beneficial, uh, particularly in that three to 500 hertz range where the majority is going on. Now, as far as in the bass, you have this one big, looks like a null, right at 60 hertz. Um, and that is pretty much going on no matter what you do. <laughs> and so that is an indication that you have a standing wave in this room. Um, oh, right. I didn't even look that low. Yeah. Huh. yeah. And that, I mean, that's going on no matter what you play, which makes me think it's, it's probably the front to back of your room. Yeah. standing wave that's yeah. going on there because you've, you've addressed the side to side standing wave and that would be at a higher frequency with your subs being on the left wall and the right wall but it looks like you do have a standing wave going on uh front to back in your room now that could take some doing because that might require you because i mean it, it, we're not really concerned about what your speakers are doing there it's just you happen to take full range measurements of them so we're seeing it there too um but that might take some doing with playing with your dual subs because we definitely don't want to have a null going on at 60 hertz. There's nothing you can do with equalization to really help you right. out there. Um, so that might take some playing with the position. I bet Gick, I bet, I bet Gick asks them, uh, suggests a panel, uh, uh Oh, monster a resonator. But yeah, yeah, Helmholtz res. I mean, monster bass traps even wouldn't reach really low enough to no, address that. No. You would need a tuned one of what they call their Scopus bass trap uh, if you're going to come yeah. at that. But you have the dual subs. You have some latitude in placement. You also haven't done anything with playing with the phase or polarity of the subs as of yet. So I would, as far as that 60 hertz null goes, don't worry about measuring the speakers at all just the two subs just the two subs together uh if you want to go by roomy cube uh wizard measurements to look at that by all means that's fine but you can also do this by ear if you want to just do some trial and error uh playing a bass sweep on repeat you'll be able to hear that 60 hertz null that's that's going to be apparent yeah. in the bass sweep uh and if you can do some experimentation with adjusting the positioning and the phase uh on the subs hopefully you can address that 60 hertz uh, no, because that's that's sort of the biggest problem in the base. Uh, but yeah, overall, right. I'm not actually anticipating that you've got. I know these, these, you know, these look like squiggles, right? You're like, oh no, I've got squiggles going yeah, on. This isn't a perfectly squiggles. flat line. Yeah, it's not going to be in a room. And honestly, it's it's like I say, it's really in that three to five hundred hertz range, which is very much treatable. I anticipate you will have nicer looking results once you get those uh, treatments put in place. Uh, but you got to play with the subs to address the sixty hertz null. Yeah. Uh, okay, wait, I had to scroll. I scrolled back up on accident. 
No, actually, no, I was looking at the pictures. Dave. Dave has his full-sized theater downstairs, and he did some upgrades. So his small 10-foot by 11-foot podcasting room. Is this DJ? It is not. This is... Uh, sorry, he said what uh, podcast he was from. I forgot to write that down. I would have to look it up. DJ sneaking in here Movie again. Chatter Podcast? Dave, well, movie Chatter Podcast. That's him. That's Dave. Movie Chatter. One of DJ's... This is my new favorite movie podcast, by the way. <laughs> One of DJ's direct competitors. There you go. Uh, Dave has his full-size theater downstairs and did some upgrades, so his small 10 by 11 foot podcasting room got the hand-me-downs. A Marantz SR5010 receiver and five Klipsch bookshelf speakers. Most, the least amount of power ever used by a Klipsch speaker. <laughs> you could wear them. You could, you could put them across the room from each other and your headphones drew more power. He wants a sub, but on a very tight budget, our usual $500 picks are too much. Uh, under three hundred dollars is what he's aiming for. He doesn't care if it's physically quite large, and he'd like to fully pressurize the small room. To that end, he was considering Mono Price's SW15, but he'd like our advice before pulling the trigger. Does REL fit the spell? I don't remember how expensive REL is. RSL is probably what RSL. That's one I'm thinking. thinking of. Of. Uh, no, four hundred dollars is the RSL. So yeah. even that one, I know uh, that that's our that's our number one choice below five hundred dollars. But even that doesn't fit here. I would beg you to build a cardboard box model because the SW that's a 15 inch driver that a is one. a big old honking box um now mono prices measurements mono prices measurements are honest they they go by CEA 2010 and so when they say that the minus 10 not minus 3 the minus 10 decibel point of that SW15 is 30 hertz um oh jeez it's <laughs> well, it's not as much to worry about as you might think, though, because they aren't DSP controlling this. They aren't server controlling this. They let that driver run wild. And so its peak output up at 50 and 60 hertz is so much louder <laughs> because, I mean, like if you look at the SVS subs, honestly, what those subs could be putting out at 50 or 60 hertz is way higher than they do because they use their DSP control to actually knock down significantly what's going on at 50 and 60 hertz so that it's more linear across the board. So it's a little bit tough to just go by the specified uh, frequency response because they're actually so honest that it makes their numbers look worse <laughs> than they genuinely are. You aren't coming anywhere close to the headroom output maximum of 50 and 60 hertz of what that SW15 can do. So right. it really can play easily linearly down to 30 hertz it has extension below that it just is 10 decibels quieter at 30 hertz than it is at 60 hertz playing at maximum because they aren't tamping down 50 or 60 hertz at all so i don't think it's a bad choice at all but i would beg you to build the cardboard box because i i don't think i mean he's like i'm the only one in this room i've got free reign of where the sub goes it's still huge i would urge yeah. you to get a 12 inch sub instead i know the numbers don't look as impressive but the sw12 that monoprice sells which saves you even more money will be able to handle this room just fine i would also recommend the dayton sub sub 1200 um the dayton sub 1500 okay. is only 240 bucks the dayton sub 1200 would be perfectly fine in this room none of these are 20 hertz subs these aren't digging subterranean we're not going to get that at this price point uh the port tuning just isn't there and all that but either of those i'd be pretty darn comfortable with all right last question because i got a son to okay. take to something <laughs> dan dan has been enjoying his audio education journey it has led down many rabbit holes there seems to be no end to the variety of high-end audio reviews measurement only objective reviews myth debunking youtube videos myth promoting youtube <laughs> videos and all matter of contradicting mm. advice Dan has primar focused primarily on the quality of his speaker subwoofers and room treatments, but all of it is now on hold as he recently found out he has lost a significant amount of his high-frequency hearing in his left ear. He wants to make sure his own hearing is as good as it can be before he goes back to worrying about audio equipment. And honestly, despite all the reading and viewing he's done, the topic of one's own hearing is something that seems to garner shockingly little discussion. So... What are our thoughts on the subject? Are all gear reviewers and technical discussions actually overblown when their real discussion ought to be about their own hearing? I had my hearing tested. It was years ago now, but it was uh, before we left to go to Australia. So it would probably be about 10 years uh, ago. And I had shocking, shockingly good hearing for you know, as far as my extension. It was I don't remember it. I published it uh, at some point somewhere. 
on the it's got to be on this website someplace so I, I published the results here and let everybody know what my hearing was uh, the fact is after you hit 35 you start to lose a, a lot of your top end and the reality is there ain't a whole lot of information up there anyways that we can that anybody actually not tremendously cares about. there's mosquito you know wings but uh... yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> mosquito noise that they like to talk about that the only that teenagers can hear which is not totally true uh yes there are there are uh limits to human hearing and as you age those limits become more uh, depending on how you've lived your mm -hmm. life you know i know a lot of people who own harleys who think that loud pipes saved lives even though all the <laughs> data suggests that that is not the mm -hmm. case uh and have hearing loss because of it acdc fans and other people who love to go to very loud concerts have a lot of hearing loss because of that musicians a lot of hearing loss because they weren't protecting their hearing when they were young and uh you know all sorts of other people that you know work in fields or have hobbies that uh can damage their hearing uh, i've been fortunate in that uh all the hobbies that i've had uh, and uh the the lifestyle choices i've made have been such that my hearing is not been adversely affected uh too badly i didn't go to very many concerts when i was young uh, I rode motorcycles, but not very often. And all the the bikes I rode had, you know, reasonable pipes on them. Uh, and once I got into the audio industry and started doing this stuff, I started protecting my hearing a lot more carefully, including just things like mowing the lawn and all of that. But in the end, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> I believe. Uh, what gear reviews are and uh, what actual subjective uh, uh, reviews do is they reveal at least within the confines of the person's room and their acoustics and how things have been set up. Uh, the person does not hear really all that much better than you do. Uh, that's the reality of it. I have sat down people in my home theater who have never cared once about how something sounded never cared once and when i sit them down and i take them through my review process and this happened with a friend of mine when i lived in jacksonville uh i sat him down and i had two speakers in for review and he's like well how do you do it and i was like well this is how i do it and i kind of walked him through how i did it and he's like i never noticed that things could sound different before i'm like <laughs> Well, how do they sound to you? And he told me what he thought. I was like, that's how they sound to mm -hmm. me. I mean, this is a guy who's worked construction his entire life, probably has hearing loss based on, you know, all the hammers and everything else, in, you know, he's been doing. And it's more a, a thing of practice and experience than it is of somehow having a quote unquote golden ear. You know, people, you know, they love to say, oh, I've got a golden ear. I can hear the difference between <laughs> this and that. Rob will talk about the difference between oboe sounds. Right. Is that because Rob has got like some sort of weirdly tuned ear <laughs> where he can pick out one oboe versus another oboe or an oboe that sounds real versus an oboe that sounds. No, Rob played oboe. I didn't right? play oboe, but <laughs> I played in an you orchestra have... so for a while. <laughs> yeah. So he has experience and that experience is what informs his ability to hear something. So are they actually overblown? Well, it depends on who's talking about them, to be honest with you. But you know, yes, somebody's ability to hear, you know, that is something that you should at least consider. But most of us have some hearing loss somewhere oh, oh. in the in the frequency range. And uh, but most of the things that people are talking about as far as, uh, you know, real differences between speakers are things that if you sat down and did the A-B comparison, you'd probably hear them too. I mean... <sighs> sort of the philosophical way to come at this uh, or, or perhaps even the objective way to come at this is the idea that um, do we want to try and have our speaker set up compensate for our own hearing or do we want our speaker set up to just convey the signal accurately and then if we have known um deficiencies in our hearing we use hearing aids we use something that actually right. goes in our ear as opposed to trying to get the source to change because the, the thing is is that you know you're walking around every day you're listening to the real world every day so right, if your right. hearing is changing as you age which it does it happens to all of us our hearing changes as we age but it changes gradually unless you go through a traumatic event that that damages your hearing but if you're talking about the gradual change in our hearing just from age, that's happening, you know, slowly and we're listening to the real world every day. So if 
our speakers continue to accurately portray real sounds, right. it's going to sound the same to us as real life. You know, if you record a real sound in real life and then play it back accurately to the speakers, it sounds the same, even though your hearing might have been gradually changing. So, I mean, we're seeing more and more of this move towards attempting to more objectively measure audio equipment, attempting to establish some standards. You know, I mean, we can measure and target objectively uh, very well for our video standards because those standards exist. We've been saying along, we don't really have those standards for audio. It is much more challenging in audio because the room plays such a significant factor. And are we really going to standardize the room to the part that says, well, you just can't have a home theater unless it's exactly these dimensions built out of exactly these materials exactly this way. That's an unrealistic standard to right. try and achieve. But, you know, all of Harmon's research is going into, well, you know, can we come up with a, a playback system that not completely regardless of the room, but across a fairly broad number of rooms uh, delivers something relatively close to accuracy? And can we, you know, sort of uh, get to a standard of what that accuracy should be? And the whole idea is that it is taking that real life recorded sound and accurately portraying it. So, I think, I, I mean, I think it's wise of you to say, well, instead of continuing to worry about upgrading my speakers and amplifiers, when I know that it's my hearing that's starting to go, maybe I should spend some of my time and money on that. But, yeah. you know, I wish we had better hearing aids than we do. I don't think they're anywhere near as good as they could and should be, especially for the sort of prices that are being charged for hearing aids. They're really just little amplifiers that aren't, aren't as good as I really wish they could be. But yeah, trying to compensate for all of that in the speaker itself, it's just going to start to make things sound less like real life because real life isn't changing its sounds and compensating for your hearing. So if the idea is to recreate real life in your room, then uh, we just want it still portrayed accurately. Right. It doesn't matter what your hearing is if what you're going for is I want to hear things the way that... Uh... The, the that that sounds tr true to life yeah. for me yeah. because if this is how you hear this is how you hear you right. don't want your speakers to try to like rob said compensate for your hearing loss you want your speakers to present to you the most realistic presentation and then your brain does the yep. rest so you don't have to worry about it. so he asked what are our uh, opinions on developing the skills of critical listening and what do we think are the best ways of going about it and what effect do we think it has on one's perception of quality and detail um so critical listening skills are not nearly as hard as you think they are to develop. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's lots of tools out there and Rob's gonna, gonna point you towards one here in a second. But the reality is, is when we talk about going out to audition speakers and we give you some advice on how to do that, all we're asking you to do is develop a few critical listening skills so that you can go out there and accurately sort of make a decision about these speakers. So what do you do? Well, you get a piece of music that you know is well recorded, or maybe a number of pieces of music that you know are well recorded. You put them onto all one CD, and then you listen to them over and over again while spending time paying attention. You would be surprised how little you pay attention yep. when you're actually listening to music. <laughs> you're sitting there and you're thinking about your day and you're you're scrolling through Facebook or you know whatever app you use to connect with other people or you know you're you're just reading the news and getting angry or you're thinking about this or you're texting your friends or you're making some plans or you're shopping on amazon you're not actually sitting there and listening so this, this happens more often than you think and you hear it happen or read it happen in reviews all the time i played this music and i, I heard things i hadn't heard yes, ever all the time yes it's because you hadn't paid attention until just <laughs> now you just now paid attention to it for the first time in a really long time and now it's the, it sounds new to you no you sit down and you pay attention to some music and you, you try to pick out not just what they're saying, not just what the notes are, but the notes behind the notes, the instruments behind the instruments, the 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 the, the harmonies, the 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 little flourishes, you know, the, the the low bass, the high highs, and you pay attention to all that, you know, and then you listen to it on a number of different systems until you can start to say, oh, okay, I can pick this out, I can pick this out, and our memory is. You know, for audio, it's pretty short. They say three seconds. I can't really find anything that confirms <laughs> that uh, empirically. But 
we if if you play a note for us and then you you distract us for a, a minute and then you go back and play that same note not many of us will be able to say whether or not those two notes were identical mm. or not or whether or not the speakers that were playing them sounded exactly the same even if we, they you tell us that those were identical notes uh, but if you were listening to the same songs over and over again for a very long period of time you would be surprised how easily you'll be able to pick out the things that are not there or the things that you're hearing better than you're used to hearing because you were paying attention the entire time and that you, you ask what effect does that have on your uh, perception of quality and detail well it has a lot of uh, of it informs your ability to assess quality and it gives you uh the ability to uh to hear detail because you're paying attention but it takes work and not many people want to do it instead what they do is they go to the store and they let somebody play some music for them they go wow that's something <laughs> great and then they they buy the speakers they put them home and they play lincoln park on it and they're like that sounds like garbage i'm like that's not the speaker's fault <laughs> you know i mean i mean i like lincoln park as much as the next guy but they really only sound good on like you know your car stereo on the highway so you know, you gotta you you have to develop those skills beforehand. Yeah, I do think part of critical listening, uh, much like critical thinking, uh, is actually having the glossary to help you identify uh, just with a word. It, it really helps when you have a sort of industry recognized term uh, to help you identify what it is that you are hearing, what it is you're trying to describe. Because if you just try to do everything subjectively without the glossary of terms to do it, it's imprecise and it's difficult to convey what you're talking about to someone else. You sort of have to agree on a lexicon <laughs> in order to, right. to, to um, discuss these things in a, in a fruitful and meaningful way. So along those lines, uh, Harmon's How to Listen which, you know, it's, it's their sort of instructional program. But what I find most valuable about it is isolating areas of the frequency range and saying, okay, he, this is the term that we use for that frequency range. Um, and that just helps you to identify it. It helps you to isolate it and think about it as an isolated variable, uh, which really helps the entire thought process and then the communication process of it after the fact. So, I mean... Is this the only way that you can describe sound is going by Harmon's How to Listen? Well, of course not. All words are made up, as Thor said. <laughs> right. But um, th this is sort of you know widely regarded as a way of coming at this, identifying frequency ranges, identifying things like you know what is reverberation, what is decay time, what is reflected sound you know get getting that glossary of terms to help you understand and identify you might be hearing something but not know how to describe it and even if you're not talking to someone else about it just trying to keep your own mental record of it or your own written notes about it is difficult if you don't have the language to associate with it so i find that really beneficial and helpful and yeah harman's how to listen is a great program to go through i think if you're interested in this subject you'd really find it a lot of fun and interesting but yeah it takes time and dedication and uh, some of those tests whoo boy doesn't matter how good your hearing is you're gonna be like man i cannot tell which one was the one was unmanipulated right. and which one was and it's yeah. it's a challenge it's it's, it, it's humbling it for is sure. yep. and, and and, it's, and i think i did went through that program when i was you know reviewing speakers all the time yeah. and i found it humbling well and so. honestly that's good too because it helps you to realize a lot of this stuff that gets talked about, particularly on forums, particularly on ones that like to address the objective measurements to what is audible, and you're like, a whole bunch of this stuff is not actually audible. <laughs> That's <laughs> These right. tiny That's changes right. that you can see on a graph. Yeah, you can measure it with a microphone and see it on a graph. Not going to dispute that whatsoever. In real life, it takes much bigger swings than you might think to actually be able to tell things apart. And that's good information to have, too. Okay. Who do we have left? We have Bob. Evans and Paul together because they asked very similar questions. So I stuck those as one. Uh, Dave, Infinite, Gary, Russ, and Peter, which I'm pretty sure his name isn't actually Peter because he's in Sweden, but he, you know, anglicized it to make it easier for us to pronounce. Oh. <laughs> I feel triggered right now. I know. <laughs> I feel, I feel targeted. All right. Uh, we want to thank our listeners for the week. We want to thank our 120 patrons over at patreon.com, including Ilongo. Oh, yes. Uh, Patreon.com slash podcast if you'd like to sign up for an automatic monthly donation. Thanks so much to our 120 patrons over there. Ilongo, thank you for being one of them. 
I want to thank Infinite Gary for talking us up the cross spectrum acoustics, uh, Emotiva, and Monoprice, as well as Scott for uh, sending Rob's money, Alongo for uh, sending some money to both of us, and Chris for allowing me to use photos on AV gadgets. I'll stop right there. Okay, yeah. Infinite Gary, thanks for chatting us up. Cross Spectrum Acoustics, Emotiva, and Monoprice all know that we exist now. That's really cool. Uh, Scott, thanks very much for uh, sending me that uh, money. Absolutely didn't have to do it, but yes, I did do some back and forth with him via email and went into some of his plans. So he appreciated that, and uh, I appreciate him thanking me with a PayPal. Uh, what do you call it? I don't know. Donation tip. That's what I'll call it. Tip. Ilongo, yeah. thanks very much for the Amazon gift cards to both of us. And Chris, thanks for giving Tom permission to use your photos on avgadgets.com in perpetuity until the end of time. <laughs> Lastly, we'll thank uh, Trey, Scott, Longo, Evans, and Bertrand for their notes of gratitude. We sure will. Thank you very much, Trey, Scott, Longo, Evans, and Bertrand. Do appreciate those notes of gratitude and uh, encouragement. It still goes a long way these days. And a huge thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. As you can see, the podcast is going strong with questions still rolling in. So uh, yeah, we'll keep going as long as people keep asking. That's right. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Mandry. And I'm Rob H. Now stay in and listen to something. Once your question answered, send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.